This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. A very good morning, everyone, and welcome, a warm welcome to our Sunrise Safari all the way from South Africa. We're in the Greater Kruger National Park, and what a start as the sun is trying to push up there. My name is David. And manning the camera with me today is Craig. Craig, how is it going? Yep. Very good. And we are all excited to have you on board. And it gives us a lot of joy when you keep asking us questions, hearing comments with you, and always giving us your feelings and your thoughts. As usual, keep tweeting on hashtag Safari Live. And also don't forget to follow us on the YouTube chat stream. All right, we are all set out for the day. You have just seen a beautiful sky there, as Craig was showing you. And we are three of us out, as usual. We got a gentleman who will be doing lots of trucking today, and his name is Steve. And we got another gentleman who will be driving like me, and his name is Ralph. Now it's time for business, and it's time for us to get to the animals. Good morning, and 58 degrees Fahrenheit, that's the temperature, and 14 degrees Celsius. So that feels very good for me. It's not cold at all. I do not have as many bears as I have always had. I only got three, which is not bad. The times, I had seven. But I still have my gloves that were bought for me the other day by Steph. This one's going to be very good, so the other two won't leave behind. All right. We had lots of hyenas, as usual, last night calling, and Habi tells us he also had lions also roaring last night or calling last night we are not sure whether it was a pride of lions or it was a coalition of boys either the birmingham's or the avokas but he says he must have had some lions last night very good it's time to look for the animals and also we got news tingana was you know uh, seen by the viewers by the dam cam around 12 midnight so who knows after she or after he drank some water tingana is one of the leopards around this area and after he drank some water what direction he took we'll be finding out and maybe the best people to let us know where he might have gone are the bushwalk team Yes, well, good morning, everybody, and a beautiful dawn it is, 14 degrees Celsius in the southern hemisphere in Juma and the Savi Sands, and my name is Steve. I'm joined on camera by Fergus, and we are indeed out on foot, and what a beautiful day. Um, it is medicinal Monday morning, so you're going to have to wait a little bit longer to see how that all goes. It's going to be false marula morning, and as always, this is interactive. Please send through your questions and comments. Don't be shy, even if it's just a comment to say, how are you doing? If you don't have any questions because you know it all, well, that's beautiful. But just let us know you're there. Um, yes, indeed, David said he heard a uh, lion's calling. Herbie is almost certain. Herbie's with us on security and tracking this morning. He's almost certain that there are lions on the property by the calls he heard last night. And indeed, the old duke, well, I don't know if it was the old duke, but apparently it was the old duke seen on the damn cam. So we are kind of doing a bit of a loop here. There were some lots of tracks of animals just on the other side here of quarantine that we're running. NYC, this little Mondays, you happy about that? Fantastic. So there were tracks of animals that were running across. Um, Tingana came, or a leopard came from that side. Maybe that's what caused the animals to run. Um, running in the dirt, it's quite characteristic of a big hoofed animal. Even hyena were running in that direction. So we're gonna go investigate and see what it is we might uncover. You never know, folks. It's 100% live. We could bump into absolutely anything just down the road. Absolutely. Thank you, Steve. Good morning, everybody, and welcome aboard my part of the Sunrise Safari. We're coming to you live from the Greater Kruger National Park in South Africa. And you are watching Safari Live, and my name is Ralph Kirsten, and on the camera I've got Senzo this morning. How's it, Senzo? And how's it to all of you? And happy Monday, a lovely start to the week. And, well, starting the week, I'm hoping that we can also uh, get in touch with a few of these... Um, these kitty cats that are running around the property it seems like there's at least two leopards in the central area and possibly some lions around as well 
So that's why I'm just keeping on moving. And uh, please don't forget to send us your questions and your comments on the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter and on the YouTube live chat because we'd love for you to get involved in the search uh, for all sorts of animals, big and small, out here in the bush. So, the sun hasn't even risen yet, and it's, um, it's a cool morning, but it's not as cold as it has been uh, the past few days, with us having a, a quite a big cold front having moved through, and uh, I think we're in a little bit of an occlusion, uh, or stuck between two cold fronts. So we're getting actually a bit of warm air now pushing down um, from the high felt. And so I wouldn't be surprised if it's a day or two of hot or warmish weather with that kind of berg or mountain breeze type uh, um, warm air coming through and then after that we might get uh, another wave of cold weather and that's generally what happens in winter down here on the eastern part of South Africa uh, with these cold fronts coming through it always pushes that warm air down from the interior uh, down towards these parts so we get uh, quite fluctuating warm cold weather so we're in one of those nice little warm patches which I think is uh, nice for us driving around and also for the animals I suppose it does give them a bit of a respite from the cold now, summer, yes, we obviously we, we do have a little bit of a speed limit uh, when we're on safari. Um, you know, generally, if you go into the national parks, they normally put it at, um, depending on the area, between 40 and 60. Some places on the open road, you know, heading between the big camps, they do make it 60. And then obviously um, on the smaller little game parts and routes like this, they normally make it 40. But um, we do sometimes go a little bit faster than that when we are on our way to uh, something in particular. And we need to get there quickly, um, you know, if we've heard alarm calls or something like that. Because, um, you know, if you know the habits of these leopard and wild dogs, sometimes lions as well, if you don't get to an area very quickly uh, you could miss that animal and then you won't see it and and you might have been searching for two and a half hours and you've got one chance to get to where those alarm calls are coming from and um, well you've got to do it quite quickly so you just need to be a little bit careful in those times obviously being aware that you you might have animals coming in front of you but um, well I'm going to continue on and see if we can find these fresh signs of these leopard, possibly lion as well. And let's head you over to Rafiki Dave because he's doing exactly the same. Very good. We have just seen some trucks, what I want to believe are lions. And uh, we turned around. We initially saw them going this way, but we have seen them again. They have turned back going in this direction. And that's what we want to follow and see whether they might lead us somewhere. And as I said earlier, Habi, one of our game scouts here, said he had lions last night uh, either, you know, roaring. We think they could be their avokas. Not sure for a fact, but I think they could be their avokas because they look like six sets or like, you know, like three lions. If they are, then those could be three males. Not a whole pride, not a whole set of trucks we have seen. And that's what we want to follow and see where they will take us. It could be exciting. We haven't seen lions for quite some time. So just keep looking on the ground, not to drive over them. So if anybody else comes behind us, can always fall on the same. Sometimes you follow trucks and you think you're getting so close and then you miss them. And then someone else comes and just does one turn and gets it right. We saw the other day we were following some wild dog trucks and they turned left and or rather right and then Taylor came, she turned left and she saw the dogs at the same junction we were in. I just took one wrong direction and she took the right direction but sometimes it's always by coincidence. Beautiful. Fluffy, good question you're asking. Do I know what happened to the cheetahs that we saw a few days ago? And we just confirmed, uh, we were told last night, they moved to a different property. And these cheetahs have been mobile, have been moving a lot. And we were told they were out of the property, but we'll not be surprised if they're coming back maybe in the next few days. But 
if the trucks were seeing will lead us to lions, it would mean we have seen lions come in, cheetahs go out. Cheetahs come in when lions are not there. So there could be that possibility, but we just confirmed yesterday they moved to a different uh, property. Craig, you let me know whether you think the sign looks good or we keep going. Keep going. How does that look? Just seeing the sun coming up and trying to brighten our morning. A bit of trees on the way, but what beautiful eastern horizon there. Just popped up. And that's a glorious ball. Thank you very much. And sunrises and sunsets sun sun in Africa are always amazing. Just about 10 seconds of silence and watching that ball come up and gracing our day. Excellent. Thank you very much, Craig. That's very good framing. And that should be a good omen for us to get these lion trucks that were following. And I'm sure the bushwalk team is also doing the same. Fantastic, David. I'm looking forward to the update on the direction of those tracks and where exactly are. Maybe we can come give you a hand. But I found a branch of the false marula that I'm going to be talking about in a little while. I found a beautiful spider underneath the leaf. I'm sorry I destroyed your home, little fella. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this entire leaf off again and I'm going to put it inside of another branch and uh, he's going to keep growing and doing his thing without me making him into some medicinal um, part for the morning. So I take that whole leaf off there and I hope he likes Hairy Gwari because he's going to, be, so, going to be putting him in there. You're going to stay right in there, sir. There we go. He should be just fine. It's still nice and green and nice and bushy in there. He should be able to catch himself some food. So as soon as we get an update, I think Hobie's on the radio now with David about where those tracks are. Now, somewhere over there, we're doing a big loop this way around. And there's quite a good chance that all those animals that were running were probably from from lions. That's what we characteristically, characteristically see in the morning. A group of animals like in parlor all bunched together because there were some frightening things in the night. And then deep tracks in the ground as herds of wildebeest ran for their lives away from meat-eating carnivores. I suppose that's the same thing, isn't it? Carnivore eat meat. So I'm sure Herbie will have a update for us soon but we were doing a big loop around this way to try and to try and pick up on any of those activities where they might have been coming in we kind of know the routes that the the Unkuhumas like to to travel and um, one of them is to come across down down here on the other side of Philemon's cut line Philemon's dip all the way through to the north and the evokers while we're still working on their routes they just starting to claim this area as their own so I'm sure they're still trying to figure out the best ways but they were calling last night Herbie said he heard more than one it sounded like a group he wasn't sure exactly so if it is indeed the evoker males through David's tracks then they're definitely making themselves well known in the winter night okay well we're going to carry on we're going to find out from Herbie any updates on those tracks and who knows we might find ourselves some lions Well, everyone, I'm just running a quick process of elimination because um, I found some very fresh tracks of um, ngwe, as we say here locally, ngwe or lip, and uh, a lovely, nice, fresh scat as well. So um, I'm just uh, running towards uh, the, what is it, the northwestern boundary up towards the gate, and then I'm just going to loop back a little bit. Um, uh, th this cat is in the area here. So as I say, I'm just doing a quick outside check and then I'll just go in a little bit closer um, uh, and see if I can find this leopard. Now, this is fantastic to start the week off, having lots of fresh signs 
And I wonder if um, David is going to be able to find those those lions. Let's hope that they've stayed on the property and not um, walked off onto uh, uh, one of our neighbors. But, well, even if they have, we'll have to just change the focus onto something else. And you never know, they might also turn around and come back. So we also got the potential of these cheetah having re-entered. Who knows? Now, Chris, it seems that um, there has been a little bit of word of Hosanna, not not a, not a, a massive amount, but it seems like he has uh, made his way down into the Kruger National Park, and he has been spotted um, up a couple of trees and so on, um, and looking quite healthy. So that's good news, and um, well, you know, like Hukumuri has been doing, uh, Hosanna will still have to go through that process uh, of sort of trying to find a spot and turning around, turning around, turning around and eventually settling on a little territory of his own. It seems like Hukumuri has started to now settle in an area. Um, I'm just hoping we can see him soon again um, because that would be great and uh, if only he could also make his territory uh, on, on... I know that conflict slightly but um, well it would be nice if okay sorry guys the gremlins are attacking me a little bit i think it might just be this corner so i'm going to send you off to david while i just get around the side well sorry about that sometimes gremlins will always come and go and we're still following our trucks which have made us again turn round because at the point we lost them we saw more of them again moving in the same direction this is where we started before went backwards following them and then we have agreed with craig chances are they might have come this way and now this is new direction we have taken which we originally started on and finding out if they'll be of any use but looking at them closely now they look to be like female trucks not what i thought were male trucks and maybe fully grown females and if the female then chances are they could be the nukumas and on this very soft sand is the places where you don't make a mistake on what direction they have gone and we think they might have gone a bit to the left here so we're going to follow them and they're more of females not what i thought initially to be males they're a little bit smaller i've been able now to look at them more carefully and the sand or the trucks seem to be going in this direction i'm thinking the nukuhumas 10 11 12 you know uh, odd number of lions would be seeing lots of trucks but not as many we are seeing a maximum i think four maximum uh, numbers of the lions so we're gonna follow them very quietly i've told hubby and steve Tony, which is my favorite, almost common pride, I would say, Tony, I would say for me the Nukuhumas. Nukuhumas looks to be a very strong pride. You know, the sticks have been suffering from uh, mange, and Nukuhumas the other day did something I thought was quite unusual, bringing down a huge male buffalo. You can imagine, eh? Then, unfortunately, we had the avocas that came and threw them out, but hopefully they had eaten enough. But I was amazed, and I really respected uh, the Nukuhumas for a job very well done. So I would say the Nukuhumas is my favorite pride of lions. And if you look at the coalition, I would say I would go with the avocas, the three boys, and I think they do a very good job. But Sonia would say, looking at the prize of lions between, say, the sticks or the Nukuhumas, the ones that I know, Nukuhumas are my favorite. I think they do a very good job, and especially when I see Amber Eye and the one that has been having a wound that by now has recovered. Yes, I would say Nukuhumas are my favorite lions. And the trucks keep going this way. Uh, yes, good morning or good evening, good afternoon. I mean, you're asking where are the Birmingham boys if the avocas have come back? We have no idea, but definitely I can tell you for a fact, they're not within our property. And the last sightings we have had here for coalition of males have been the avocas on two occasions. Avocas came in, did what they did, they had a kill, 
out they went, then they came back, Nukumas came, and the Nukumas, you know, made the kill of a buffalo, the Avokas came, ate it, and then they went out. But on those two different visits the Avokas have had, the Birminghams have not been here, and they have not been heard either. But I'm sure they could be in a different block. But nobody, personally, I would not know where the Birminghams are. And you're thinking slowly and gradually, the Avokas might be making their presence felt, and they could be taking over what, you know, the Birmingham boys have been controlling for a long time. Who knows? Only time will tell. Robert, how are you? Always a pleasure to hear your name. And you're asking whether the Nkumas are comparable to any pride that I know of in the Maasai Mara. And I would say they could be very close to the Black Rocks. I'm sure you might have been following us maybe from early this year or last year. We have a pride of lions that we call the Black Rocks. I'd compare them to the Black Rocks. And the Black Rocks is also a very good number of about 12, 14. So oh, I would say 15. The Black Rocks are always about 15. So the Nkumas being... 10, 11, 12, I would compare them to the Black Rocks of the Mara in Kenya. And the trucks keep going down. And please don't forget, always keep us engaged with your questions. Hashtag Safari Live, anybody joining us now? And keep following us on YouTube chat stream. Craig, how are we doing? Can you see some trucks yet? All right. We'll follow our trucks and we also got the experts who are doing a better job maybe than me on the ground. Fantastic, David. So wondering what tracks exactly they are. We're going to try and get our way in the area. Herbie's going to try to chat with David on the radio now and see exactly what direction. Oh, that would be very helpful to know what direction they're going. Okay, so possibly the Unkohumas, but who knows? But a direction would be very helpful. There is the sun with their leopard orchid, with their fruits coming out the side. Really special, you know, it's the second time I'm seeing them like that. And I don't think I've ever seen them fruit before. Don't know where I've been. Some squirrels shouting in the background, but that's probably just for us. They don't know that I'm a vegetarian, but they probably saw Ferg, who's not a vegetarian. So, folks, it is a beautiful morning. It's definitely lying somewhere, somewhere out here. And we're very excited to try and find you some. Obviously, um, that is not the be-all and end-all of being a bushwalk. We're also looking for tracks along the way and small critters. But these are the best times of day to be following up on the movements of our large predators. So, I can hear David's vehicle. Leslie Acres, so it's 7,000 hectares. So Acres is about times 2.2, I think. Uh, that's just Juma. And then the Sabi Sands is about 60-something. So we're looking at about 130-odd acres. And the Kruger National Park on its own is 4.2 million acres. So that's a very large area. Plus the associated reserves around take it up to about five or so. And they've then dropped the fence into Mozambique, which doubles that again. Look here, between nine and 10,000 acres enormous area but it is still not enough we need more we need more we need more and the reality of it is that the Kruger National Park is is a long strip like this and all the rivers coming in come from the west they come from agriculture they come from forestry they come from urban developments and all that sort of stuff so Australia is the only country I know of in the world that has managed to go and conserve all the way to their catchment what is happening a lot now is we're looking at what we call biosphere reserves which are incorporating communities, agriculture, and conservation. But there's still people living in the landscape. There's still pests, there's still invasive plants, all that sort of stuff. So what Australia's gone and done is they've gone all the way to the catchment, all the way up into the mountain, and they've conserved that area from the top where the water comes out of the waterfall all the way down to the estuary in the ocean. And that is what we really need if we want the landscape and for conservation to work 100%. Okay, thanks Steve. Uh, absolutely, I love it when we're talking anything conservation. Um, 
And I like the whole idea that um, us as Wild Earth, we are also going to be, um, I'm surely, forming a big part of conservation as well, especially with this type of research that we almost unknowingly are doing with these little catch-up videos and highlights and all sorts. And us following the tracks and, and movements of um, leopards and lions, and obviously in particular, um, and also these cheetah as well, seeing where they're coming from, where they're going. Um, and getting a lot of footage of them uh, recorded too. So uh, what is research? I mean, it's basically um, capturing of data and, uh, you know, and, and then analyzing it afterwards. So um, I'm hoping that uh, lots of analysis could lead to, um, you know, all sorts of uh, different projects being uh, uh, completed and, and looked at. And uh, I think it's fantastic. Um, and that's aside from what, um, you know, the conservation that Steve has been talking about. But, well, for us to perform that research, we've got to actually find the cats, which is exactly what I'm doing. What do you reckon, Senzo? The, the track gone up that one. That's a power line road. Uh, there, I see what you're talking about. Yep. So, there's a couple of leopards that have been moving around here. And that's a little bit more difficult to follow a track or, or you know, stay on a trail like that. That's why the two of us between the cameraman and myself, we need to be quite awake um, because, you know, sometimes you can miss which road an animal has taken or it's gone off the road as well. So just trying to keep up as, um, as close as we can behind these fresh tracks. But there seems to be a quite a bit of turning around because one's come up via teller access, which is a pretty straight road, and we're almost running uh, parallel to that now. So we'll do our checks and searches here and then uh, maybe broaden the search a little bit after that. But now you can see the sun having come up quite nicely now and I'm sure that it's going to warm up quite considerably, considerably as well. It's a beautiful colour, a little bit of a breeze coming through but not a very cold wind as I said earlier, quite a lot warmer. Now, Puma, um, every now and then we do see some small cat uh, tracks like Caracal, but not very regularly, um, and does show that uh, there's not a lot of them around. Um, it's always normally relative when you've got lots of very large predators. Obviously, the smaller predators do stay very secretive or move to areas where they're not so much under pressure from these larger predators. Um, and so, yeah, different areas can have different concentrations of, of, of um, different predators, really. And here in this part of the, of the Sabi Sands, there's obviously a big concentration of leopards. And it does then affect the other predators in the area. And as I say, um, mostly the smaller cats, they're um, very rare, if, um, if not non-existent. So they, and, and that takes a heavy toll on them. But, uh, well, we're not complaining that there's lots of leopards around. Robin, yeah, I agree with you. I hope we do see them one day. So, Senzo, you're saying it cutting across there to Voyatella. Okay, well, we're going to have to just um, keep going because we've checked that side. And, Robin, I also definitely hope that we see them soon or see some other little uh, predators and I will make sure uh, to highlight it if I do find one. Well, the search continues and let's hope that somebody's going to come right very soon. Well, we have lost our trucks again and we want to meet with the trucking team and we combine forces and we tell them from where we are, what direction they should be going. Because the trucks are so fresh, as they say sometimes, you know, steaming, but we have not been able to know at what point they're turning out of the road. And they're looking at them for the second time again to see what direction exactly they go. Just let Habi know that I'm going to use my game drive radio for a minute. Uh, Habi, we are back on the road and coming towards where you are. And it's always a challenge when the trucks, you see them on the road and then they go out, you lose them and then they come back again on the road, eh? But I'm sure sooner or later we'll be seeing them and confirming once you combine forces, 
with the tracking team. We'll be knowing where exactly they are. And let's hear something from Ruff. Well, yes, everyone. Uh, so David and them, they're going to continue on that side. I'm just, um, I'm heading down towards quarantine now. And then I'm just going to try and follow up. I know that with Tingana being seen on the dam cam around midnight, and after that seemingly heading towards uh, Central Road, um, heading south. So I'm going to, I'm going to just try and do something like that. We'll have a look at uh, the little roads in between where we have seen these leopards frequenting, like Ingwe Alley and what's the other one? We'll go and uh, we'll check Central. We'll check. Um, uh, Twin Dams Road, and we'll go down, uh, check out the Mlawati, and what do you say, Senzo? Uh, Senzo's Loop, we'll maybe <laughs> check Senzo's Loops, uh, that's Senzo's self-proclaimed um, little loop that I'll show you. It's got Senzo's Pan and Senzo's Dip, um, a very interesting little loop, that, that one. <laughs> oh, look what we got there. There's, don't fly away, please don't fly away. It's normally when I stop that they fly away, but there's a little lilac breasted roller. A very pretty bird in the morning, and there he's giving us our, his call as well. Hello. There's that squawk. He's got something stuck on his bill. And let's listen for his little squawk. That's what I was trying to imitate the other day. Not very well. When I was on bushwalk. He's got to keep his balance there, a little bit of a breeze coming through. And he's also nicely fluffed out. As I say, it's not icy cold this morning, but uh, it's a little bit of a breeze. And with the early morning, it's, it's a little bit cool. Um, but I wouldn't say it's very cold at all. And what is that stuck on his bill? Quite interesting. I'm sure you try and scrape that off. Very pretty birds, eh? <laughs> Caitlin, you think that my um, bird and mating calls should become a regular segment? Well, I'll try and keep it fresh. And uh, thanks, Caitlin. But yeah, I'll, um, I'll I'll have to keep thinking of the different bird calls and mating calls and all sorts. So we'll keep a keep it fresh, keep it um, interesting, and well, keep it funny if, uh, if I can say that. If not stupid, I don't want to look stupid or, or carry on stupidly, but we do just try and make it a bit fun. See there now, I'm trying to brush off that little something on the top of its bill. I'm really struggling to keep a nice, comfortable position there. With the wind blowing a little bit. And here's a good looking chap. Lilac breasted roller. They're really struggling. Whatever that is, is right on the top of its bill, and when he rubs it, he's rubbing, rubbing on the two sides, and almost just staying stuck there in the middle. So one of the passerines, it's got that true perching claw or finger at the back, which does then help it to perch. You wouldn't see a Koran or a, or a um, thick knee being able to perch like this. And they would be literally falling all over that branch because they're so well adapted to being on the ground. They don't have that uh, back toe that enables them to grab onto a branch like that. Well, that is quite pretty. Nice and fluffed up. Looks very cute, eh? Hey? All right, Mr. Lilac Breasted Roller. Now, Crafty, you're exactly right. A lot of the time, the pretty birds don't sound very pretty. Uh, absolutely. And it goes it goes without saying with a lot of these birds, the lilac breasted roller. Um, you know, okay, some of the little, like the... Um, the little sunbirds. They are pretty and they also sound quite pretty. A lot of them quite chirpy, high-pitched little call. Um, but yeah, the lilac breasted roller definitely doesn't do his looks justice with his call. Now, sorry Mr. Lilac breasted roller, I'm sure if you really want to stay on your perch you can. Otherwise I'm just going to make... Oh, what's that? That looks like a gymno jean. 
There he goes. There's a the gymnogym flying through. I wonder. There, off he goes, right through. And if you got able to see it there, Senzo, if you were, that was good aiming. Very yellow face to him with grey sort of feathers. Gymnogene or the African Harrier Hawk. Two names. So, are we going to be able to get closer to these cats? It's always, um, always surprising. Gizmo, that's a, that's a good question. My favorite type of bird. Um, I, I, I sort of changed different favorites uh, because they're all so interesting, a lot of the birds. Um, the little fork-tailed drongo, I do really have um, uh, quite a lot of uh, feelings for, should I say, because it's quite similar to the honey badger, where they're not scared of anything. They can very well mimic a lot of the other birds. They're a little trickster. They hang around the large game, um, flying underneath their feet just about as they walk through the grass, uh, you know, bumping up little insects and so on. But if there's a crowned eagle or a black sparrow hawk or anything that um, is, a, is a raptor, they, they are always bombing it. And uh, it's, it's crazy that doesn't matter what bird of prey you see, it's normally got a honey badger hassling it. So <laughs> you always feel for the raptor, but you always think, come on, and for the, for the little drongo. <laughs> so I do like the little drongos. Yeah, Luke in FC says you always got to support the underdogs. And I'm sure with the Soccer World Cup on the go at the moment, there'll be lots of that. Um, stadiums, especially neutral fans, always like to support the underdog. Yeah. Now, fresh signs. Fresh signs. I'm going to head, as I say, towards Vuyatila Dam. Tony, I'm not exactly sure on the number of uh, bird calls that I know, but I do know sort of the majority uh, of the bird calls here in the low felt as well as in the eastern cape um, and yeah so obviously through a lifetime of of um, of being in the uh, in and around the bush and then going through training and um, uh, and uh, obviously spending a lot of time on my own uh, birding as well as then uh, teaching I think you know I think I learned the most actually when I was teaching um, students uh, with all the different uh, subjects in mind uh, I think that's the time it's strange hey um, I actually learned the most when I was teaching because when you do repeat it uh, something so many times obviously it becomes easy to remember um, but the other thing was that I always had to research a lot more because you had the questions and in-depth questions um, that uh, put you on the spot um, and immediately made you go and find out so that you could answer that question properly um, and so that's when I learned the most but I wouldn't be able to put um, I wouldn't be able to put an exact number on it um, because I'm not, I'm not uh, particularly a, a counting birder. Um, not that I, I think that's a problem, but um, uh, somebody that does count his birds, and I think it's fantastic, is Steve. <laughs> well, hello. Yeah, bird calls. I know lots, lots. I've got about 650 birds ticked now. Most of their calls, I suppose, are, are working. But um, here we've got a lion track. It's not the biggest track, but the reason I put the knife down there so that you can have a look, see how much bigger it is than the, than the knife. Now, your average male leopard track is about the size of this. So you can confuse leopards and lions with, with size, but we've only got one here. There's a couple more just in the road there, but if you just found the one, there's two tracks here just found the one there's the back pad and there's the toes over there heading in that direction so they're going sort of west from where David got their tracks we've now got the tracks we're gonna see how we can do we have just bumped into David in the road we've sent him around that way sort of like a, a very favorite route the Nkuhumas like to do they've come from Impala clearing this way they come across this open clearing they like to walk straight down in this area towards sort of Treehouse Dam and then quite often out into the west it's kind of what they do so if we can check those areas ahead of them then we can catch up because if we had to walk track by track the chances of you finding an animal yeah that happens 
but you've got to then be walking quite quickly to catch them because bearing in mind these animals are moving or were moving so knowing the landscape you kind of have a look the tracks are heading in this direction stand up have a look at your direction the sun is over there so we are kind of looking at a sort of a westerly southwesterly sort of perspective and if we know our terrain we know that treehouse dam is there and we know that the boundary is that side so they're somewhere in this direction so we're going to keep checking that way and if they don't cross west then we're going to move down and move towards the east kind of got to know what the animal's doing that's where the scientific thoughts come involved it's after some pretty moist elephant dung not that fresh Sammy, it is a lot of intuition, but it also comes with experience. You know, they reckon the art of tracking is what developed the scientific mind. Um, Homo sapiens, before we were able to develop really intricate weapons for killing animals, we, we used to poison them. So we'd get some form of poison, dart them, and then that animal's not going to die immediately. You have to then find that animal. So we have to track it. What's going to happen to an animal that gets darted and poisoned and invariably starts losing strength? But because it's lost, there we go. That's a much better track. That's a much better track there. Very clear now. You can see the back, back pads and the other toes heading in that direction. Once again, just for points of reference, have a look at the knife. That's bigger, is it not? But that's probably one of the young females. Not enormous. So um, you then got to think like the animal. What's the animal going to do if it's getting tired and losing condition? It's probably going to go and drink. It's probably going to, if it's a type of bush buck or kudu, it's probably going to go into some thickets. You've got to just sort of start thinking like the animal. And each animal is different. Each animal behaves in a different way. Okay, here yeah, the tracks have all met up. There's more of them here. They're all heading across in the road. Beautiful. And if you can think like the animal, well, then you've got a better chance of catching up with them because if you don't think like the animal, you're going to go exactly like this. You're going to go, okay, there's one track. Okay, there's two tracks. Three. See how long that's going to take, folks? Instead of going, okay, what direction are they heading? And then you can make a, an intuitive decision about where you might be able to intercept them. Very good, well done with the tracking there, uh, Steve. And my magic from last night has not come back where I have been doing things and tracking and getting the animals like last night, but hopefully it will come. And when Steve is talking about tracking, it reminds me of football when the team manager or the coach will always tell his players, make sure you track your opponent, make sure you keep an eye on your opponent. And that's what has been going a lot. Uh, more in football and unfortunately our African teams have not been doing very well We're just hoping some good tracking uh, Tonight when we see Tunisia playing England and hopefully they're going to track and mark the opponents So our trucks disappeared again, and we're trying to see whether we're gonna see fresh ones And all what you're seeing here are elephants and rhino trucks it seems there was some splitting of some rain here last night. So we're going to go to the tree waterhole and see if there could be some lions which could have gone there for a drink or just hanging around there waiting for some prey to come and have a drink. Once in a while, we have known, you know, predators will hang around waterhole areas waiting for antelopes to come for a drink and they'll get themselves a meal. Great sun like that has come out now i bet not being very busy we've got one eagle there i don't know craig what do you think uh, do you keep going there's an eagle is we keep going craig an, an eagle on top of that tree there is that a good move forward oh, that's good okay keep going that's good okay let's find out there's a huge, turn my foot off the brick and find out who that is. Excellent. This could be maybe our first uh, raptor or our first animal for this morning. And looks to me like a juvenile butler. Looks to me like a juvenile butler eagle. Very fluffy. There's a bit of wind blowing 
and maybe that's why she doesn't look very neat on her feathers. And my guess that's a, a butler and a juvenile one. See so how they keep turning their heads. Are they looking for prey? Very sharp sense of smell and sight they got on many kills from predators. They are always the first arrivals, and more often than not, they'll always arrive at the kills before even the vultures. As much as they fly a bit low, they don't fly very high like the vultures, but I think their sense of smell is much sharper than the vultures. Clearing her beak there. And it... Thank you very much. Very nice to see a raptor this early. Sometimes they take rather long before they come out. And as it heats up, because they may need a lot of thermos to keep gliding in the air, but to see them out this early is a good chance. Is a, you know, a good start. And I was talking about last night, I saw another butler, Eagle Juvenile one. Australia, I agree with you. It looks so cold to that particular, you know, uh, Batlua, and that was saying uh, the feathers look a bit fluffy, and so the temperatures are still quite low. I'm not sure we have gone to 60 plus yet Fahrenheit, but I think the temperatures are quite low. And when the temperatures are still low, they'll tend to, you know, tuck in in their blankets of feathers until maybe it warms up later, and you can see them out and about, either flying or just gliding slowly and enjoying the thermos. Very good, Batley Aigo. Hope you have a great day, and maybe you're going to lead us to something. If the lions, I think we just, maybe the trucks we saw, could make a kill, I'm sure that Batley Aigo might be leading us to somewhere. All right. Thank you, Craig. Tony, good question. How far do raptors like this fly to get food? And Tony would say it depends on where the food is. If the food is about 20 kilometers or 20 miles from where they are, that is where they will go. And some of them, I'm sure like, you know, like the vultures, which will not hunt for themselves, they'll always follow the predators. So that you see, they fly very high, they use the thermos, and you see them just gliding in the air, looking on the ground. And once they pick up something, that's where they go. So anything, depending on the habitat, where they are or what the predators might have done 15 miles 20 miles we have known vultures that will even fly for about 100 miles 100 miles again also depending if they have a breeding area to do there are certain vultures that will come for example hang around here and then fly to certain cliffs every day to go and roost so what determines the distance of where they go is all food so we hope that's back clear We'll be seeing it later in the day, flying and using the thermos in the air. And we'll be following it up and find out if it might lead us to something exciting. So just about to get to the tree waterhole area. We'll have a quick look here. Let's see if there's any trucks or anybody who could be having a drink. Looks rather quiet. Not even the common lap. Wings we all should see here, the blacksmith lapwings. You see anything, Craig? Well, terribly sorry about signal there with David. We've still got the tracks. They're heading directly in a very similar direction to what we had before, but they're keeping with the road, which is clearly what animals like to do. We see it with, with predators all the time. Even my discussions yesterday with the elephants and the rhinoceros, they like to move along the road because it facilitates quicker movement. And what we've seen along the way here, and if I just have a little feel, the wind is coming from over here, that direction. And along the way here, I think we might find another one. The lions were walking, and then they did their characteristic lie down, and they constantly seem to be, if you look at this track over here, 
let's track over here is the left foot. You can tell it's the left foot because the longest toe is the middle one. And the, as they walk in, they keep twisting. They're twisting in the sand, which means, for example, if I'm walking like this and something catches my attention, my, my feet sort of kind of move. So if we lose these animals, we know that there's a very good chance they've moved in on this side, purely because the intention of what they're doing when they're walking in. Along the way there, maybe we'll find another one. There's areas where they've been lying down and looking in that direction. So if we do lose them, they might be on the new road there where the cheetah were spending time yesterday, but it's not that far, unfortunately, from the western boundary. But we still got them, they're still moving steadily in the road. We're gonna see what we can do. Very fresh, very, very fresh. Every now and again, a youngster seems to jump up on a, an adult or on another youngster and push it down. Oh, Ashley, lion dung is very easy to identify. Before you walk in there, Ferg, here's the foot, here is the, the tail, here is Herbie's walk through it, but here is where the body of the lion was lying. There's one leg, now the foot, the body was lying, looking in this direction. So yes, Ashley, lion dung, I will try and find you some. Um, I just happened to have left my, my scat book at home today, but um, it's very easy to identify when you find it. It is, it is enormous. Have you seen a domestic cat scat before? It looks like that, but add a hippo inside. <laughs> no, not a hippo, but really, really big, and often lots and lots of fur. Lots of fur, because when they feed as a pride, uh, they don't have the time, like leopards and cheetah, to, to pluck the fur out and be quite delicate with their food. They just... Here we go, here's some more lying down. This is actually beautiful. You can clearly see, you can see the lines here of the hair. See the hair over here? Here's one of the feet, would have laid down. Here's a bit of the bottom. Very, very cool. And here's the leg as it came out. So lions, as they walk, suddenly, you know, they get a bit lazy and they just, so they walk along and then kind of just sit there like this and then you've all seen it before they start to nod off and then immediately they're awake again you get lulls in the evening lulls in the movement and this is what allows us to catch up with them because they stop from time to time we're fit we're strong we're gonna walk but you know the best thing to do and what we've done is sent David all the way around that way is obviously if he cuts these tracks then then we can we could jump ahead but um yeah we on their tail we don't know how long ago they were here but it was definitely in the night early early this morning and they're stopping and starting stopping and starting stopping and starting which is what makes it easy to find them always oh, nice to be out on foot and it's also lovely to track them with the sun behind us because what that does is approaching dangerous animal on foot one of the, the situations is wind the wind is in our face which is great animals aren't going to know that we're necessarily coming if we keep quiet and the light is behind us which means that animals have to look into the sun to see us it also makes our approach a little bit less obvious the sun is in our face first of all it makes us quite tired trying to look forward and second of all it lights us up and you just basically materialize to the animal whereas now we're just a bit of a shadow they're not quite sure what we are so those are some of the aspects yeah still lots and lots of tracks in the road moving around you can see them all here nice and fresh nice and fresh lots of them so with the conditions very important to pay attention to wind and to where the sun is. And those are two of the primary things we talk about when doing trails guide courses. Well, I believe David has sorted out his technical issues. Let's go see if he's managed to find tracks that side. Sorry about all the technical issues. You know, once in a while they'll be coming. And we got a hornbill here having its breakfast and trying to devour that dung there. And you can see how it is just spreading it apart. When you look at the big animals like rhinos and elephants, we have noticed they are like a whole ecosystem by themselves. How they support 
other lives, for example, the ox pickers, the bats like this, when they eat, we think, you know, they damage the trees, which actually don't, because they also march as much as they eat. And when they have the droppings, they have so many beetles and insects inside the droppings. And this is exactly what this red bill hornbill is trying to get. You've seen sometimes elephant dung coming through and the beetles will come out alive with very poor digestion system. The beetles will always come out alive and he must be a very hungry one. The good news, yes, that's a great comment and this looks like an absolute she is enjoying every meal here and very happy and wondering why she's a bit selfish I don't see any other hornbills you know with her as she discovered the fist and she's like yes it's me who discovered it and not anybody else who would be here and not one I'm just wondering whether she is going a little bit deeper on the ground unlike on the dung itself because sometimes when the dungs are dropped, they may cover an area and then it becomes a bit humid and some warmth so might also try to push up. But you can tell she is enjoying every moment. <laughs> Lisa is saying, oh, Pam, you're not a bad, but you know, uh, I'm trying to imagine also human being eating or feeding on, you know, uh, poo of another animal, but the birds have somehow to survive and again it's a whole ecosystem where elephants and rhinos or the big animals will always have the system and everybody depending on each other and Lisa what would you like to be Lisa would you like to be an antelope would you like to be an elephant Lisa or would you like to be a big mammal and not a bird just let me know what Lisa you'd like to be and I can tell you she might be staying here a little bit longer Actually, you're asking, do dung beetles, do hornbills eat dung beetles? Is find them? Yes, they do eat uh, dung beetles. And apart from dung beetles, they'll also eat lizards. And most birds, as much as the hornbill we see here is an, an omnivore, they'll also eat seeds and flowers and small leaves. No doubt about it. Uh, the hornbills will also eat dung beetles, but I think the specialists of eating dung beetles are the ground hornbills. The ground hornbills, when you see them out there, will always get the dung beetles, crush them and feed on them. And I can tell you, she is enjoying the best of her, her life in the morning. And unlike hyenas, I've seen hyenas once they get a kill of food, they call each other. But this hornbill is like, this is my discovery, it's my party and me alone. So her long beak is very important. Rich <laughs> saying, would it be having a lizard or something else instead? I don't know because it's things a bit messy to use your beak to poke in that pool to dig out the insect or to dig out what is there. But we have always seen them after all what you know should be doing and feeding, she is going to leave that fist or that poo and then she is going to rub her beak against the tree trunk to clean herself. But yes, with a choice, I would say an insect, straight clean meal, or a lizard, a lot, you know, a, a, lot, a lot lean and a bit cleaner. But now that leaf doesn't have anything on Bill. Stick to the dung. And you see the advantage of having a long beak. Lisa, thank you very much for your reply and they are all wonderful animals in the world. Well, it's always very difficult. I've always been asked also once in a while what animal they like to be. And when I look at all the beautiful animals, I'm like torn between them. And I do not know what to decide, Lisa. Occasionally, very quietly, I'll always whisper, I would like to be an elephant. Who knows? So we're going to let this uh, hornbill keep enjoying her meal and just move on. Sorry, hornbill. And I'm sure as soon as we move, she'll come back to her meal. I can see some dwarf mongoose from a distance. Let's see what they can get. Get them. They're sunning themselves up on a tumid mound. All right. 
Right, we've got some antelopes now from a bat. Let's go to some antelopes. Yes, we indeed do have some antelope, and we've got a very good looking male Nyala with his hair standing up nicely on end there on the back and in the beautiful morning light as well. And it looks like he's courting one of the females just near to him there. Um, but now he's been distracted a little bit. And there's another female that's into the, into the fray. But they are all looking very pretty. And I, I often stop and just watch antelope like this. Not only because I think they are very nice to watch. They are beautiful and uh, it's important to also watch their behavior. Um, but they often also, when you stop and spend some time with them, do um, sometimes give away the presence of predators. So it sort of serves as a dual purpose because those ears are like massive satellites picking up anything in the area. So very good to watch, especially Nyala Kudu, as you know. They are the real lion and leopard indicators. And look how pretty she looks. That's not massive, massive ears relative to her head. Now, troublemaker antelopes such as these, which are Nyala, um, they'll feed on a bit of a mixed diet, but mostly um, leaves from different trees and bushes. So they'll feed on guari. Um, that one is quite a little bit bitter, but they'll go on to acacia or vachilia and senegalia um, and, and a very vast array of different um, leaves and I've even seen Nyala um, eating quite relatively toxic plants as well like the milkweed which is the host plant of the um, of uh, the African monarch butterfly which uh, as you know is quite noxious and a very bad bitter tasting and so they they actually get that flavoring and noxiousness from um, the host plant which the larva feeds on or the caterpillar and that being the milkweed, and yet Nyala literally feed on the milkweed as well. So they must have a countering um, uh, balancer in the, somewhere in the uh, digestive system, because otherwise they would also feel that noxiousness of the milkweed. Now, love, hope, faith, um, I think the, the major difference between antelope and deer uh, is the, the horns. So antelope um, have got horns which are uh, not shed as opposed to deer shedding theirs on a yearly basis. Um, and uh, while these are bony, almost ossicones at the bottom of those um, of those horns, and then they they've got that uh, that um, uh, almost like your nail uh, with the keratin covering that ossicone base or horny horny base, like you have with giraffe. Um, that's like the the basis of of a horn, which then uh, covers that. And if they lose or break one of these horns, they do get uh, you know a little bit of growth coming from the bottom but they don't regrow a full new set and um, so they've got these for life and whereas the deer they shed their, um, their antlers on a yearly basis so I think that's the major difference between the two but I'm sure genetically they're probably almost identical with maybe one chromosome difference or so but watch this Nyala as he puts those hairs up. So, uh, me at FC, um, it uh, you're asking. Um, sorry, just remind me that question there because I've just got a bit confused while I was uh, talking about this Nyala. Please, Luke.
Right. If um, if one of these antelope had to lose its horns, is that its chance of breeding done uh, or at breeding done? I would say that it's probably put it at a, at a major disadvantage if it loses both of its horns. Um, so, you know, sometimes when these impala or chemspok or anything like that, sometimes when they lose one horn or it gets broken, oh, here comes another contender. Let's see if they do their typical nyala dance, which is a very slow sort of move in here. Um, sometimes when they lose one horn, it can actually put them at an advantage because um, they almost get in from the side and they can stab a little bit more. Um, but generally, you know, generally I would say on, on the whole, uh, it would put them at a disadvantage and they wouldn't be able to challenge as well. And if they had to lose two horns, well, I would say that they're probably going to die because uh, they're going to get attacked by another male and they won't be able to defend themselves and they'll probably get stabbed. So I've seen probably the most um, amount of dead male antelope, you know, as caused from another male, I would say uh, in my guiding career has been down to Chemspok or the Oryx. Um, they are extremely aggressive towards each other and... Um, uh, I, um, I've seen many many dead chemspok uh, with one horn in them, uh, stuck, broken in them, and I've also seen lots of uh, live male chemspok uh, or oryx uh, with only one horn. And I must say as well, next to the water holes, uh, wherever I've seen chemspok, whether it be at, uh, in Itasha National Park, Okokoyo, Halali, Namutoni, and all those water holes around, um, you know, we've spoken about the animals that have been the most aggressive around the water holes. And it's mostly elephants that, as you would think, shift animals away from a waterhole, or if they if they want to take over, they do. But in terms of the antelope, I've seen chemspok being uh, the most um, sort of dominant uh, amongst all of the antelope around a waterhole. So I wonder, I think these two have headed down into that drainage line to have their uh, little standoff, these two male and yala. And, well, we'll leave them to it and carry on our leopard search. Yes, from the impalas, from the nyalas, we've got more antelopes here. And how is that, Greg? Is it good? We've got more antelopes here. we got impalas from the nyalas to something a little smaller. And you've got some impalas just feeding as usual, enjoying the morning light. A bit of a scratch there. And I've been trying to estimate or to imagine how many of these now might have gotten pregnant after all the writing that has been going on the last two months or so. They've got something white on the back there. I'm not sure if it's a tick or a small leaf. And if it's a tick, it's going to be a very huge tick. Sammy Jane, good question there. And you're asking, can antelopes ever crossbreed? I do not think so. And I don't think that has been tried by anybody. And you know human beings, how they like experimenting. But I'm trying to imagine a cross, that's when having a toilet break there, a cross, say, for example, what uh, Raf was just watching, Nyala, a cross between, say, a Nyala and an Impala. Think of it. You know, a cross between a Kudu, for example, and a water bag. I don't think genetically that's possible. Maybe that's how I would put it, Sammy Jim, that genetically I don't think that's practical. It hasn't been tried. The only thing I would say we have seen uh, people doing, if I just move forward a little bit so they can see this impala a bit better, is crossing horses like you know with the uh, zebras and they would get something we call a zebroid, which is half horse half a zebra that has been done and see the impalas here again and once that they do and also a very beautiful bird on the ground there and once they do that yeah there the impalas go and you can hear them just running and once they do that normally the progeny will always stop there the hybrid they get will always not be able to procreate at that point so quite interesting i don't know whether anybody i'll also ask my fellow guides thinking of a crossbreed between say an impala with a grand gazelle a thompson gazelle with a steinbok a waterbuck with a kudu a nyala with you know a different antelope
No, I don't think genetically that may not conform. And also you realize all these antelopes have different number of chromosomes. So it's genetically and more so because each one of them will have different number of chromosomes. That might not apply or may not be possible. How they have been able to succeed with horses and zebras, I do not know. So now if you're asking what season will these pregnant mothers be dropping the babies, and that will be around November, December. So with a gestation period of about six, seven months, and the rotting was going on April and May, so come November, December, we'll be seeing lots of fonts of these impalas and lots of lambs. There's always a small percentage of about 10% or so, or it's slightly a bit less, that don't conceive that time. And that's why sometimes when you're driving around, you'll see small babies, and what's around the month of uh, March and April, and the females will always conceive much later, the ones that will miss the actual rutting of April and May. Fantastic. They keep going, and as they keep crossing the road, we'll also keep moving and head into the next waterhole area and see what could be happening there. Very fast antelopes when they run and speed is always one of their strengths and they can just leap over like five meters you know from the ground and seven meters distance to keep away from the predators. I've always enjoyed impalas and their pace how the cheetahs and leopards get them down, I've never understood knowing how swift and fast they are. But again, the cheetahs and leopards are equally fast and smart, and they need to survive. They'll always have extra skills the impalas will not have. All right, let's go to the trucking team and find out the latest. Are we coming, eh? So, tracks of those lions have come all the way down yeah. right here. We're now on our exactly western boundary, and this is exactly where they've come through. From, from that side, coming straight through here, crossing into Simbambili. Here they cross. Well, that is the way it works, I'm afraid. That's the way it works. Lions have crossed. That side, and we're going to keep walking down here and see. Maybe they've come back in, but there's a good chance that they've been hunting in that direction. Um, the way that they're moving indicates that they're definitely on the prowl. And trying to, as I said, catch up with animals one track at a time is very, very tricky. So you need to get all the way around to be able to find them. Well, that is the way the cookie crumbles. Summer, I actually love it, hey? I love it. You know what? There's no thoughts of anything else in my mind when we're tracking. I'm just tracking and smelling and feeling. And it's actually the living in the moment to its fullest. There's something that some people experience from time to time in high adrenaline sports. They get that feeling of euphoria and then it becomes addictive. I suppose walking out here, living in the moment, tracking animals also becomes a little bit of, a, of an addiction. And it just forces you to be right here. In the moment, I don't think about anything other than what we're we doing and in the moment and survival, survival in the moment. Hey, Ferg, what about you? Ferg's always trying to frame the shot, I suppose. What are you thinking of, Ferg, when you're tracking these big things? Ferg's got all sorts of things on the brain when he's doing it. He's going to jump onto the side of the road because there's a vehicle on their way down and uh, we don't want to get driven over because that's something you have to pay attention to is you have to look left and right when you cross the road. Well, and a very obliging giraffe as well because it looks like a, quite an old female, this, but she's posing beautifully for us while she's feeding on this uh, buffalo thorn here. And we can hear the arrow-marked babblers doing what they do best in the background as well, making a racket. If you listen carefully, you might hear them. Making lots of noise there. Yeah. 
There we are. So the female giraffe carrying on feeding, being serenaded by some arrow marked babblers. And that is really tricky work that she's doing on a buffalo thorn, Ziziphus mucronata, very dexterous with her tongue because that has got seriously hooky thorns on them, so on those branches. And one of the trees that you can very easily get stuck in without knowing. And often when you're walking on bushwalk and you walk below one of these and just one of those branches touches your hat and you inevitably land up walking off without your hat on and it's hanging up in the tree. And that happens almost on every single walk. It's always always quite funny to watch, especially someone in front of you with their hat hanging in the tree while they continue walking. But uh, this giraffe having no problems in getting around those thorns. It's incredible. The skin must be very tough because of it or, you know, in spite of it. And the tongue going in there, I just shudder to think if I had to put my tongue in there, how many holes it would get in it. Now, Joe, you say, look at those eyelashes. Yes, they are very elegant, very pretty. Looks like they've got mascara on. It does make these giraffe um, look very, very pretty. And well, you can see a lot more fine than a uh, sort of male. She's quite an old female. And uh, you can just see there isn't a callus and, and stuff around her face. Now, Crafty Puma, um, she, she could be pregnant. She does look rather rotund, doesn't she? Um, but that does, I'm not quite sure. Um, she does look quite round, but um, I wouldn't say yes or no. Um, you know, definitively, I can't uh, guarantee it, but th there's every chance that she could be. She's looking a little bit large there. Maybe she is. But what I can say, she's got a beautifully dark pattern, and very often the older giraffes start uh, exhibiting that darker shade of brown on, on, their, on their patterns like that. She's a very good-looking giraffe. The, the ever-present oxpecker going about its duties. He sometimes like what it's doing there. Sometimes they do get a little wound and they can very easily keep that open, you know. So they can actually become a parasite on some of these antelope because they are sanguinivores or blood eaters. And that doesn't matter if they're eating ticks, which are full of blood, which have engorged themselves, or drinking the blood straight from the antelope, because they often pick the ticks off, and then they leave a little wound there, and then they'll open it up and make sure that the blood keeps coming, and they feed on that. So they're not always helpful, are the ox peckers, and it looks like that one trying to get into a wound there, or make a wound, looks like to me, well, they can do that on hippos, they do it on giraffe, buffalo, all of them. And so sometimes you can understand the irritation from the from the host animal um, because it's not always just tickly. It can absolutely be um, sometimes sore as well from these little birds keeping their sores open. Now, Sammy Jane, you say what, what's the what's the purpose of ossicones on a female giraffe? Well, she could also use that head like a pendulum club, um, but you know, not necessarily just the males using it um, to establish dominance between each other by swinging and hitting each other um, through necking. I'm pretty sure the females would also use that as a defensive tool per se. Uh, their biggest defense is obviously their kick whether it be you know kicking out the back with their back legs and also stomping down in the front with their front legs um, you know bone jarring and smashing kicks that uh, they can exhibit and I'm sure with that head she could also use that as a good defensive tool as well so 
I would say, you know, generally when you see animals, both male and female, with um, horns, uh, you know, the females also do use those horns, especially for defense. And here with the female giraffe, I would, I would put it down to that as well. They obviously don't use it as much. You know, and I was talking a little bit earlier about um, sitting with antelope and watching them as a good marker for predators as well. Well, uh, giraffe, they are also fantastic spotters because of their height advantage. So you can often see them looking in a direction and go to where they're looking and you find predators too. So they're also a very good predator indicator, are the giraffe. Richard, good question. Why do giraffe have white ears? Well, especially from behind, you get this very clear white marker that you can see from very far, obviously with their heads being raised. Um, but it's mostly from behind that you can see them very clearly. And like the water buck with a nice big ring around their bum, um, and uh, the kudu with a very white tail that they raise as they run through the thickets as well as the impala also with those white uh, uh, sort of raisable hairs on the on the tail um, and many other animals with different uh, follow me signs the lions have black tufts on the back of their ears giraffe have white tufts or white hair um, on the back of their ears that's making it for the group um, and especially mother and youngster to be able to follow each other uh, if they had to be running away from potential danger or just leaving an area or moving away from a, a bull which is causing havoc uh, etc uh, for whatever reason they are running or they get split up that's a way for them to find each other again with that white on the back of the ears so uh, a lot of animals do have this kind of follow me sign. Now, Squabby, you say what's, um, what happens if they break one of their ossicones is quite similar with the horns. They might um, grow back a little bit, uh, you know, in terms of how it would have grown uh, initially anyway, but it won't grow back to full size. Um, uh, it, it is a lot harder for them to break uh, the ossicone uh, as opposed to breaking off half of a of a horn because this is all bone based. So if they had to break that, it's also you know sort of forming onto the skull. Uh, it would have probably a, quite an effect on the on the on the skull itself. So you know not as easy to break an ossicone as it is to break half a horn off per se. So and this has been absolutely magical, sitting here with this giraffe feeding on a buffalo thorn. But once again, I think it's time to continue the leopard search. Very good, such a huge uh, lion mammal to see. And now we've got something small and different. And this is not a mammal, but a reptile. And this is the water monitor lizard and as the name implies always not found very far from water sources or water points and she's just sunning herself there and you can see the green patches in the foreground there an indication of water not very far from where she is definitely being a cold morning and reptiles being cold blooded They'll need to bring up the body temperatures up after having gone through the night. And you've always compared leopards to having very strong neck muscles. But I'm looking at this small reptile here and wondering, you know, they equally got very strong neck muscles because to hold that head this long, I don't know how long she has been holding it that high and how long she'll remain in that particular position, signing herself. Is also an indication. She got, uh, I would say, she also got equally strong muscles on, you know, strong neck muscles. Very, very territorial reptiles.
So, Richard, that's a good question. And how often do they shed their skin? I have no idea. I mean, uh, all reptiles, including snakes, will always, well, not all reptiles, but like monte lizard, uh, either the water monte lizard or the rock. Uh, monte lizards, snakes, they'll always share their snake. But these particular ones, I have no idea, but I have seen them do that. And I'm not sure it's like every couple of years or something like that. Uh, Sammy Jane, I have no idea, honestly, after how long they do that, but I can find out for you. And it's just like snakes are uh, difficult to know after how long they'll shed their snake. But if maybe the snake ages up or the skin ages up and they need to shed it to get a fresh one, they will do that. We have seen crocodiles, how they replace their teeth if the one that is there is worn out and having new ones. And I don't know if it's the same formula that would apply to these reptiles, that the skin that's, you know, out on them, once aging up, then a new one will start growing and push out the other one. Very good. Luke just told me, according to Google, they shed their skin two to four times per year. Thank you very much, Look in the final control. Well, yeah, Sammy Jane, they shed their skin two to four times in a year. So I'm imagining two to four times is it every three months? Yeah, I would say about every three months, two to four times in a year. And, you know, we have been always wondering, yep, Wisteria, that's a lovely question. And can I tell whether this monitor is a male or a female? And she turns to the left and I'll tell you, Wisteria, it's very difficult to do that from where she is. From, you know, just looking at her like that, it's very difficult. And we have always thought the best way to do this is to anatomically maybe turn them around and just go to the cloaca and that way we can feel. We have always known the females will have like an appendage just by you know where, where, uh, at their genitalia will have like one appendix and or appendage and the males will have two but it's always very difficult when you just see them from where they are to tell the difference but should you see two together you can always have an idea of the male and a female if it's not a female and a young one the male tend to be a little bit bigger and the heads of the males are, are much wider and you look at the tail the base of the tail where it touches the body for the males is a little bit wider than for the females. It's the only quick way you can tell. But when you see one like that from a distance, Wisteria, it's rather difficult to tell whether it's a male or a female. Fantastic. Let's find out how the trucking team is doing. Yes, well, thank you, David. You are certainly the monitor-finding king. You seem to find one in every activity. I find that incredible. Very, very nice. Well, we've got a track, ladies and gentlemen, in the road, and I have shown you one of these before, but not this exact track. So I would like to put it to you as a quiz. Here it is. There's two of them. There's one there, and there's one over here. And uh, there is the size comparison. It's probably about 13... 12 to 13 centimeters, maybe a little bit less. Hashtag Safari Live or posted on the Twitter, on the YouTube stream. Who stood here? Let's see if you can get it. Very, very nice track. Very easy to identify. You can see it's kind of rounded there. It's kind of like a ridge in the middle. Rounded again. Heading in that direction. There's two of them next to each other. I wonder if we're going to be able to get that. So um, we had the tracks of the Unkuhumas definitely crossing west. Um, so that's it. We're going to move off from that direction. We're going to head back towards Treehouse Dam. And I'm going to set up a little, little medicinal section over there in a little while. We slowly go to head in that direction, but obviously along the way. There's tracks to be found. There's all sorts of other wonderful things to be seen. And um, it's lovely on this little... We're on the firebreak road on our southern boundary. And this road doesn't get driven that often, so it's quite often that we see some very interesting little activities. And it's not often you see an individual of this size on the property. Sammy Jane is not a buffalo. It's very long. Look how long the track is. Very long. Buffalo is, is could be that long, but if it was that long, it would be as wide. I'll show you the buffalo track. Buffalo track is much longer, well, much wider. You'll obviously find it in the back of the book. 
Sorry, Sammy Jane. I'll show you why it's not a buffalo. There's a, there's a buffalo track. You see how rounded it is? Troublemakers, not an elephant. No. Look at the size. Look at my shoe in comparison. And the elephant tracks are very round. And they don't leave this ridge in the middle. It's definitely a hoof of some sort. Definitely a hoof. You can see the weight is put on the back over here. A nice ridge in the middle. Mm, top mod. This is enormous. This is enormous for a Nyala. Nyala is probably only about 7 centimeters. This is up to double that, 13 centimeters. So it is a really big track. And there's only one animal that you can confuse with it for size. Well, two, I suppose. Ravinda and Bobby, you have cracked it on the head there, but what's interesting about it is that it is not an adult. That's where we get confused. That's where we get confused. Ravinda and Bobby have definitely got it right. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump back to the track at the back here and show you the comparison between the youngster, which is over here, and the adult, which is over there. And there's no animal with a track of this size out here. Ah, oh, Blue Rose, you get 100% score for your answer there. It is indeed the track of a baby giraffe. And easily seen by the fact that it's very flat inside. Giraffe leave just a little ridge. Not much because of the weight that they put down. Um, it's really flat on the bottom of their foot to sort of spread the weight, their enormous weight. And you will, will not confuse any track with that of a, of a young giraffe. But sometimes people can think that it might be buffalo, as you thought, but it's way too long. Eland is very similar to that of a buffalo. Um, and sometimes you can think that it's the outside toe of a rhinoceros, but it is not. Okay, so I hope that got you all woken up in the morning. We don't see many young giraffes in this side. I saw my first group of giraffes the other day. Lots and lots of, of males hanging around, or should I say two big males that we see quite regularly. As you can see, I've shared a couple layers, but we don't see the families too often. Vegetation's a little bit thick. You know, protect yourselves against lions, giraffe one. Oh, I'm having another leaking issue. <laughs> Well, while I get my water contained under control, let's go see if Ralph's had any luck tracking those leopards. Not just yet, everyone, but I'm heading into that area uh, where Tandi and Tlalama have been seen quite regularly. And it looks like this little drainage line here is where she likes hanging around and also where she likes leaving Tlalamba. So it's good for us to come through here nice and slowly. Um, it seems there has been some activity. Um, ah, it seems like with, um, with the activity, uh, it's also an area where there's not too much signal. So I'm going to get out the other side. In the meantime, off to David. Sorry again about the gremlins there. And we just talked about the Molinta lizards earlier, uh, the ones we were watching and saying how difficult it is to tell the sex of a male from a female. And I think that was a question from Wisteria. And I didn't finish a point I was trying to put across of how they got their name. And it has been a big debate or it has never, it has never been proven how they got the name Molinta lizards. And people have always given some theories that in Egypt where we have the Nile River and the Nile River starts in a lake in East Africa called Lake Victoria going all the way to the north and that makes the Nile River rather unique because you'd imagine the river should be flowing from north to south but the Nile defies that norm and you know just flows from south to the north anyhow uh, I would say all the Egyptians depend on that uh, river for their water sources, for irrigation, for drinking, laundry and everything. But any time they would go to the water, you know, to go fetch water, 
Many of them used to die. They used to be killed by crocodiles. And they thought way back. That was a big concern, especially for the small children, when they'd go by the riverside and do their laundry or fetching or do a bit of bathing by the river, by the side of the river. And they ended up looking for a particular lizard because, of course, they knew or they know crocodiles are carnivores. And they went looking for a lizard that they thought would take care of that. And then they got that particular mountain lizard we saw there, and they could tie its leg with some kind of rope and put it on the side of, of the river. And if they would not see it struggling or trying to come out of that particular point it was, they knew that area was safe for them to go and fetch water, to do laundry, to bathe, and do whatever they wanted to do by the banks of the river. And they used it as a control experiment just to confirm that all was safe in the water. And because it was monitoring the crocs, I think, or they say, they give it the name, the monitor lizard. I don't know how true that is, but, uh, you know, it has been a theory there. Yes, and that is interesting, isn't it? When you think how some of these animals have been named, you know, zebras, giraffes, and then you go back, I mean, and you understand zebras, you may look at the meaning of a zebra and maybe not see anything. It will tell you that's the name of an animal. But we know monitors, what they mean. Monitor is something that's monitoring an experiment, monitoring a situation, or a doctor monitoring a patient in the hospital or in the ICU. But now, this monitor lizard, what were they monitoring? And yeah, it is interesting just to know they were used by the Egyptians long time ago to monitor their safety by the banks of the River Nile. Could be interesting if you find all the other animals, what their names mean. I don't know what a giraffe would mean, but I think the naming of the mountain lizard, if that is true, that was very clever. And hopefully today they got now pipes all the way to the river bringing water to their home. Better infrastructure than it was maybe a hundred years ago. Right, Ruff, how are you doing, Ruff? Not, we're not being attacked and neither are these pretty Nyala once again that I've spotted here. I know we saw some Nyala earlier on. Let's just see if we can get a nice view of them because they are feeding just in the thicket um, above from the little drainage line where Tandi Tlalamba are frequently spotted. So we're just watching them here. Let's see if they give away that there's any predators around. They don't look too skittish or nervous. Uh, it doesn't seem like there's a predator in the direct vicinity. And that one just seems to be doing a bit of ruminating, chewing of the cud. Now, Bob and Wisteria, their coats can get slightly... Um, uh, slightly heavier or slightly thicker in winter. They do get a little bit of a winter coat um, as uh, you you would see you know that um, like any of the the animals around the world if especially domestic animals if you um, see once the uh, autumn starts coming in and the, the days start shortening you can very often have um, uh, the pets molting um, and then bring in their sort of um, winter coat as it would be uh, so a little bit yeah and the, the, for the major part it's just to form a, a barrier and just trap that that uh, that air on the inside which then gets heated up by the body and almost acting like a, a natural wetsuit even though it's a dry suit they very very clearly saw the regurgitation of the cut ball Let's see nicely if we can see it again. Very, very clear. And you can see that digestive process working. Chew, 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 swallow. Uh, and you'll see it going down. See, it's swallowing a little bit as it's chewing as well. But then you'll see the very clear one big ball coming back up for that digestive process to be continuing. And 
there it comes. Yeah, perfect. Now, Leslie, you say what's um, what's the Mohawk on the on the younger males for? Uh, is it on the? Uh, I think if you mean that um, that that Mohawk, the white hair on the on their backs. Um, Let's just see if we can see one there. I'm not. Sure. Let me just move forward slightly. There is a younger male here. Let me just see if I can roll. Come on, come on, come on. No, I'm going to have to start. There's a there's a young male just a little bit further up over there. If you can see him now, Senzo. I think you can go in there. So that mohawk, um, mostly down to um, displaying. Well, between between males, so and at the moment now it's lying pretty flat, um, and he's also a very young male, so he hasn't quite got the full um, mohawk mane, as it would be. It does turn white um, at the moment. He's got a bit of a mixture there, black and white. At the base, it's black, and then it it, it turns white. And um, when they're displaying uh, at each other, and also for females, they really extend that and make it stand up uh, on end um, and uh, we also say that that's pilo erection uh, the raising of hairs on the back um, and uh, while well, they do it as I say to uh, sort of uh, exhibit at each other and towards females saying you know in a, in a very crude way uh, for me to put it would be look at me I'm a very good-looking male and um, and to the other guys, well, don't get in my way. I'm bigger, I'm more pretty and stronger than you are. Oh. Okay, I've just heard some Yala alarm calls quite far from us, but I think I need to be spinning around and going and chasing up on that. So that's exactly what we've just been waiting for. Um, and I've just hit the jackpot, but I'm not sure exactly where it is. I'm just going to follow up on that. So that's what I'm going to be doing. A little bit of a race, lots of excitement now. Going to try and catch up on that uh, Nyala alarm calls. Well, we haven't had any alarm calls ourselves, and we are trying to follow any sign that might take us to alarm calls and heading towards the Galago waterhole and chancing if we could see something there. It's time for animals to come out for a drink. You can see there's some mongoose or some squirrels running on the ground, see if they're going to stop somewhere on the tamarind mound or just in the grass. They just, whoops, just disappeared. Can you see in America? There they go. So dwarf mongoose, always very sneaky, always very fast little guys. There another one goes very quickly. Another one goes. They're trying to be very fast lenses, but yeah, that was not bad to see them just running on the ground there. They're always more colorful when you see them like flowering a tamarind mound on top, and especially the dwarf mongoose being dark and brown and staying on top of a white tamarind mound. And so nice when you see them sharing a tamarind mound together with the squirrels, you'll see squirrels on one side and tamarind mounds, or rather the dwarf mongoose on the other side of the same tamarind mound. And you wonder when they go inside there, how do they agree? You stay there and we stay here. Or while there, do they really go? Once we see them on top, and when you see them on top of the tamarind mound, they are always separate as they're two different species. But once they go in, I've always wondered, do they meet or do they interact when they get inside there? And the tamarind mound will hold so many other species, including snakes and monitor lizards. It's always a big question what actually goes in under there. The dwarf mongoose, the squirrels, monitor lizard, or snakes. Who does what? And knowing that the tamarind mound is not built by them and it's owned by the tamarinds themselves. All right, we're going to hit. Tomat, that's a good and interesting question. How do the tamarind mounds build 
uh, the amounts facing east or west or any direction. I don't think they have any direction they choose to build their tamarind mound. It depends on, sorry, just some drongo there. It depends on where they are and exactly the materials they have. But most important, how is that correct? Is that a good angle? It depends on where they are before they build their mounds. Sorry, got my foot on the brakes there. And the materials available, the source of the materials available, that determines, you know, what the, it doesn't exactly have a reason what direction they take, left or right, or any angle. So long as they have the right materials, I'm talking about the soil, and they'll always use their saliva, like water, to mix up like the cement. But what we normally see on top is always just maybe a third of an actual termite mound. Most of it is underground and it's a huge tunnel as we watch that drongo there, which once in a while they'll be known to go to feed on the same termites we are talking about. It's the foxtail drongo. One of the most elegant birds I know by being smart and neat in terms of their plumage and loves to eat termites on top of other insects. And yeah, look from the final control tells me this is Ruff's favorite bird because it's not afraid to attack eagles. And that's very true. I mean, uh, Ruff, because anytime you see a bird of prey somewhere, and of course the birds of prey, it's a good stretch on that wing, beautiful, good job. Eh? I was talking about how they maintain their plumage. And anytime you see a bird of prey somewhere, and they'll always go for these small little birds or their chicks or their eggs, the first birds always to mob the big raptors will be the drongos. They're very fearless and they're very courageous. Rafa, would I agree with you? I've seen like, you know, just two uh, drongos going to a martial eagle. Not much they could do, but you could just see them flying over the martial eagle and just, you know, becoming irritant and making his life difficult and just making noise and calls and calls, you know, and the martial eagle thought, ah, they're not trying to get me, but they're just irritating and the martial eagle just took off. I respect drongos for their courage. And many birds, like the aromarked bubblers, have used them for defense or like sentry. All right, Drongo, thank you very much. Hope you have a great day and get yourself some food. And being a cannibal, Drongo, more like doing more insect than anything else, I've already seen them once in a while going for nectars, you know, on flowers, just like the bee eaters, but they don't, you know, eat bees, but I've seen them once in a while going to some flowers and trying to suck some nectar. Actually, you're asking me the termites attract other animals that use their hole. I'll tell you, the termite mound actually have very special conditions because termites, I'm sure you know, they're that big. And there's something termites do once they finish building their homes in there where they attract so many animals. And again, as I said, be it the mongoose or the squirrels or the monitor lizard or the snakes. In the tunnel of the Tamad Mount, the temperatures tend to remain constant. So during winter, like now, if it gets very cold, they are able using their molds to bring the temperatures up. When it's very hot, like during summer, for example, when it gets very, very hot, they tend also to cool down the temperatures. And for that reason, you'll get animals or reptiles like monta lizards laying their eggs inside there. As much as they may not stay with them there to incubate them, the monitor lizards know the temperatures in the Tamad Mount remain constant all around the year. And for that reason, you get reptiles uh, like Montalisa laying their eggs in there because they know they will incubate until to maturity when they'll be ready to hatch. So all these animals have known that living in the Tamad Mound is a wonderful, you know, home or block to live in. Tamites look pretty small insects, but I think they're very intelligent on how they live in. Very good. Let's find out how the tracking's going. 
Yes, well, as we as we said earlier, the, the Unkuhuma pride has gone west, so we've given up on them unless they decide to jump over and around. We've done a big loop. We're on our way down to Trias Dam, where we will be setting up a little display for you. And uh, Alinda was asking, and the reason I'm doing this plant this week, Alinda asked last week if we could get a sedative, some form of something to help her sleep. And so the plant I'm doing today, the false marula, um, there is elements of it that you can use for sedatives, um, but that's the roots. There's a fungus that grows on the root that you can either burn the root itself or you can just scrape off the fungus and just powder it up and just use it as a as a snuff, we call it. Sort of just inhale it and it's supposed to really, really calm you down and add, add a relaxation value to it. But without having to destroy a false marula to get that for you, um, I have been looking for false marulas that have been pushed over or have had some damage to the base. But as of yet, I haven't found any. So we're going to leave the, the sedative out purely because also we're still on bushwalk. And if I give Fergus um, some sedative, we probably won't get home. We'll just suddenly slow right down, eh, Ferg? <laughs> it, it just, that just, he just smiled though. He just smiled though. But it is indeed all about dosage. And I honestly wouldn't know how much of the root to, to snort, to snuff. Because, you know, you could potentially end up completely killing yourself. As I've said before, the difference between a medicinal plant and a poisonous plant is the dosage. Your doctor will say, take two pills in the morning, two pills in the afternoon, a month course. If you take the entire month course in one day, well, it's a good chance that you could kill yourself. So we're not out there for that. We're not out for killing each other. Thanks, Ashley. Yes, it'll be a different one. I'm on foot today. Normally I have the vehicle, so today I have to carry all my bits and pieces in the bag, but that's okay. I have to take out all the books, so there's space for all the bits and pieces, and we're going to get down to Trias Dam and do a little setup over there, which should be quite nice, and I've already started talking about the false marula, and it's got some interesting sort of stories about it that we'll get onto in just a few minutes. Well, I'm hoping everything goes well there with Steve. Uh, we're just following up on these alarm calls. Uh, it did come from inside a block. So, as per usual, a uh, little bit tricky when it is inside the block because um, it's not always easy to negotiate this, uh, this kind of thick bush. Um, it did, however, seem like whatever the predator was, and I'm, and I'm thinking uh, most likely be either Tundi or Tlalamba. Um, it seems like they were on the move because um, we heard the Nyala bark and then we heard some of the little Franklin doing the characteristic grr, 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 like irritated with an animal that's near to them and then we also heard some squirrels so and they seem to be getting further along so I'm and if I don't come out, then I will head um, back towards Nyala Road North and then just check along there for the tracks. So that's it. Um, hopefully I'm getting closer to this predator and well, bonkers. All right, we still are trying to follow some trucks here, but not leading us anywhere. But we've got some nice Nyalas around here to the right. And let's see. What could be happening with them? They all look like youngsters and fully grown female there and like three youngsters there. Some very graceful antelopes we always see around and Tandy would love to get one of these youngsters here for her princess, Klalamba. Feeding on the leaves. And some of the trees, like the buffalo dawn, that you know we may hold their leaves all around the year, will come in very handy for most of the browsers. I've always loved the stripes of these animals and compared the stripes to the zebra stripes. And wondered whether the number of stripes would be the same on each side of the nyalas. The speed at which you'll see them, you know, 
getting or grabbing the leaves is always fascinating, eh? They're always very fast. A bit of a scratch on that one there. It's time to call for the ox pickers and come do their job. Troublemaker, how are you? And you're asking, do we ever see strange behaviors of these animals like eating meat? I mean, as much as all these antelopes here are herbivores, we have seen, I mean, including giraffes, including warthogs, including elands, trying to nibble on bones. And we have always guessed what they're looking for is calcium. Yes, troublemaker, we have always seen them, you know, going for meat, but more so like if you're talking about for example the warthogs they'll go and scavenge on you know meat of a node an, an old kill but huge antelopes you know you'd imagine the size of an eland we have seen them like going for bones and our guess is always they are always looking for calcium yes once in a while we have seen them behaving that way troublemaker very good we'll keep moving on and find out where all these leopards are hiding today and with all the good news that Raf thinks he is on a hot trail of Tandy and her cup, that could be exciting. Yesterday we didn't see any of those leopards, they kept hiding, not even the cheetahs and we had a lot of excitement this morning when we saw all those trucks of lions that now we have confirmed they have moved out of the blocks to the west. But good news that they came through, chances are they might come back again. A lot of trucks I'm seeing for elephants and want to go by Viotella waterhole and see if they can see some. They're having a drink. Alrighty. I just want to adjust my earpiece for a minute. Very good. Let me just adjust my earpiece for one minute as I think where these Ellie's could go and it's always exciting to see Ellie's in the morning having a drink drinking so much water so very fresh trucks of them all around and we were talking the other day was it yesterday morning of if we could have a football match as the World Cup is going on and have animals and find out which animals would be very good referees and I think I can't remember the name of the viewer who said elephants would be the best referees. Okay, what do you think of that uh, styling? Is it too high? It's beautiful styling there. Trying to sun herself. Thanks Craig. I've always loved stylings because of how they come through. Very good, how they come through in terms of their feathers, iridescent feathers, and trying to maintain itself. And wondering if, you know, talking of football, if birds would be involved in football. The animals, we thought yesterday, yes, we can have elephants as the referees, but now let's look at birds and see how well the birds would do and which team would play which side. And the first thing I'd want to know from the viewers, if I may ask you, tell me if we were to choose the match officials, which bird do you think could be the best one to be a match official, you know? I'm trying to think some of the animals as our stalling is flying away. Thank you, Craig. I'm trying to think some of the match officials, how they keep holding the ball as they enter the field. You can see, for example, a, a big vulture chip. Samijin, you're asking, do all birds shed their feathers? I don't think birds, Samijin, shed their feathers. I don't think so. They might lose one or two because of age or because of being deformed or something going wrong. But I have not seen birds shedding their feathers. The only time we see birds' feathers on the ground is when either they have died of natural causes or when they've been brought down by predators like big eagles. But I don't think birds shed their feathers. I would, you know, uh, be happy to know that, but I highly doubt Sammy James birds shed their feathers. Going on a small little drainage here. I hope I am going to keep my signal for another three, five seconds. Very good. 
So yeah, don't forget to tweet me on my small request, hashtag Safari Live, on what do you think if we'd have birds playing World Cup football here in the African wilderness, uh, which bird would you make to be the referee? And I'm thinking of either the vulture, number one, or a bird of prey like the martial eagle, there's two, and I want to give you a choice of three, vultures, martial eagle, and let me say the, the, the other one would be the, the go away bird. Mr. Zurich, you're saying the secretary bird would be a good referee. So let's move the go away bird and have the secretary bird, the vultures, and let me see which other one I was talking about. Secretary Bard, Vultures, and the Marshall Eagle. Let's have those three and find out which one you think could be the best referee. Yesterday we set her down on the elephant because we thought for the animals, the elephants will always not take any nonsense. And one and two, elephants got very good memories. So they'll always remember their rules or the football rules just like that. So for the birds, let's look at the Marshall Eagle, Vultures, or the Secretary Bird. And let me know why you think the Secretary Bird. Is it because how they are dressed and Secretary Birds look like referees? Maybe? Let me know. That's a will be seen there, correct? Is it too far? Is that too far there? I'll be waiting to hear what uh, you'll tell me and know which bird you think could be a good one. There's a lodge not far from there, from our camp, and I think Craig just spotted a wild beast, most likely in the wrong place. I'm not sure whether it's in the wrong place or the right place. And the fence you see there is from our neighboring camp, the Galago, and all those are impalas, and the wild beast, the van beast. I'm not sure whether to say she or he is lost, but he'll be joining or the rest, or if you look at the football match here, this is one team of Impalas, and then the World Beast, or the World Beast here, is the referee, is the match official, and I'm sure they're waiting for the other team to arrive on the ground, and maybe the other team I'm thinking could be the, uh, not the Kudus, Kudus be two before them, maybe the Nyalas. Busy eating, bless you Craig. And I'm sure they're going for some fobs or small little plants on the ground there. The grass, as you can see, is pretty dry. And definitely the stems do not hold any nutritional value on them there at the moment. That's a big herd of impalas, eh? It's a huge herd, could be anything 40 or more. And you have also some youngsters with their short horns. And the main guy or the main male. Marco, thank you very much for your comments. I've been lucky finding, you know, all the animals. Sometimes it's a, sheer, it's a question of luck, and every time, sometimes, you know, the camera operator will tell you it's skill and luck, but I've always thought sometimes it's more of luck than skill, and I would say we have been do I've been doing very well from yesterday. I'll bet, being quiet, Marco, as you say, especially for the cats, but all of us are still following the cats, the team, tracking ground, rough, myself and Craig, hopefully be able to be seeing some cats as we move on. Carol, how are you always? Good to hear your name, Carol. And do impalas have territories? During the rutting season, that's one time I would say definitely they'll have territories. You'll always see the males, you know, moving the females in a particular area and wanting to keep them there for breeding purposes. That time it's more definite. These other times, like now, they also have territories, but they're a bit loose. Hopefully I don't lose my signal again, another three seconds. And the territories, no worries. And uh, what should happen is this other time, you'll get them out there and the territories are not very permanent, but you'll see a particular area will always see a herd of elephants, I mean a herd of uh, impalas with a uh, male following them closely. But during rutting season, as I said, definitely that time, they defend their territories and making sure they bring as many girls or as many ladies with them as possible. Please don't forget to keep tweeting on my poll on who do you think of the buds would be the best referee.
Secretary Bud, we all know the Secretary Bud, Vultures or a Marshall Eagle? We want to compare and see who all of you think could be a good referee or a good match official who will not be compromised by taking any nonsense. Very good. I'm not sure I'm picking a cold, as Craig was sneezing before, and I'm now also thinking like sneezing, and maybe someone might have some medication for me. Thanks, David. Well, the information I have this morning it doesn't really have too much to do with um, colds and flus, but there are others that we can use, but I'm not going to talk about that right now. Welcome to another episode or morning with myself and Medicinal Mondays. Now, first of all, we're talking about the false marula, which is this lovely plant over here, very easily identified by the compound leaf. Nice compound leaf split and uh, separated from marula by the fact that these little leaflets are not on very long stalks and they're quite uniform and green in color. Well, marula's got a little bit of a sort of whitish sort of tinge to it and they are leaflets have got little stalks called petiolules. So that is the first element that I wanted to talk about but you know I was talking earlier and Linda wanted to know about sedative. You can use the roots. There's a brown fungus on the roots that you can take off and you can either inhale or burn and inhale and it'll be a sedative but we're not going to do that because we've still got to walk home. But what we are going to do first of all I collected some bark yesterday and I actually tried this last night so that we could have a on-the-go show and here is the beautiful bark. Look how beautiful that bark is inside. Nice and soft, nice and purple in color. And actually there's no medicinal value to the bark. But the reason why I'm using the bark first is I'm just going to throw a little bit of bark into the water over here. Well, there's no water yet, but I'm going to put it in there. And I'm going to show you what happens with this. I'm going to get this up and running. A little bit of water in there because what you can do with the bark. The bark's very good for tanning leather. And essentially, you should be putting one part bark to two parts water. And you bring that to the boil, and you can tan leather. Cobalt, I'm glad you didn't miss it either. Now, I don't want to spill my water. There we go. Let's get that nice and hot. Now, I'm putting the bark in the water, and I'm going to bring that to the boil. And once it's at the boil, then I can let it simmer for about an hour. And you're going to see the color that comes up. The reason I did this last night is we don't really have an hour, do we? So I'm going to show you the color that comes up in here in the next little while. But while we do that, we're going to wait for the bark to settle. What we can also do is with the leaves, I'm going to do this um, during the little show until we come back next time. I'm going to play with it. But what we can do with these leaves is I'm busy chopping them up and I'm going to make them into a little bit of a paste. And with the paste, uh, Luke, the director, has got a bit of a gammy toe uh, from he was surfing in Bali and he got a bit of, uh, bit of coral in his toe. So I'm going to make this paste up for him. I'm going to take it home. And with the paste, what you can do is you can put it on sores and abscesses, which works quite nicely. So while I get that ready, um, we can talk a little bit about the cultural sort of beliefs and ideas of this tree. Now, the false... <laughs> Luke is in great need of it, he says. Um, I'm just going to work this a little bit, let that boil, it's boiling nicely, pre-boiled water is always the best way. And um, the, the local or the Swazi, down in Swaziland, there's people there called the Swati, they speak Swati, and um, they believe or they call the false marula the tree of forgetfulness. Now why would you call a tree a tree of forgetfulness? Now there's two parts behind that. Their belief was that they would come and sit together underneath the tree, warring factions or warring tribes. And they'd come and sit down underneath the tree and forget any past battles. But to do that, they would have taken the bark, or not the bark, the roots, and that, that fungus, like on the roots, and they would have basically inhaled it, as we were talking about, and it would have been a little bit of a sedative, as we spoke about before. And in inhaling that, it would make them calm down, and then all the past woes and battles from the past would be completely forgotten. So I think that's quite interesting, and they do believe, and they call the tree, the tree of forgetfulness and healing, and healing to do with what I'm going to be doing with this soon. I'm going to be making a paste, just put a little bit of warm water in there, I suppose, paste it right down, and um, a very interesting tree. But sustainability-wise, we didn't want to go harvest the, the roots. Did have a look, but we didn't find one suitable. But while I make the paste, and while I let the color of this 
start to come out. So you can already see it coming out there, boiling. I'm just going to turn it down a little bit. While we allow this to boil off and simmer, I'm going to go back over to David Gitu. And I'm sorry, David, I'm not able to heal your illness right now. Well, Steve, uh, you have no choice. And as soon as, you know, you finish uh, making the concussion, remember, I may need some because, as I said earlier, uh, we might have picked some sneeze me and click somewhere maybe because of the dust. And I don't want to get some cold at one point because I may want to stay late watching football. So once you finish making the medicine, make sure you bring me some in the camp, eh? going on a small uh, drainage here. Hopefully we should be fine. Back home in the village where I come from, we have found out there's so many trees to we'll always use. I hope my signal is still good. We have so many trees and bushes we have always used to treat different ailments. And what have always surprised me is how our great grandfathers Unlike today, when you have all the conventional medicine, they would like you to go tell someone, for example, your grandfather, and say, I got a fever, and they'll ask you what fever, and you say, I don't know what fever I got, and then they'll touch you like that. And, I mean, we have so many fevers. We got yellow fever, it could be some malaria fever, it could be some cold of some kind. But what surprised me, they would be able to tell what fever exactly one has, you know? I mean, with all the different fevers, and then they would go to the bush and either dig some roots or a particular tree, and they got hundreds, I mean, if I stop here and Craig is going to pan at all the trees he can manage from where you are, just look at the trees that Craig is going to show you. Tall, short, thick, thin, wide, green, not as green. Look at all those trees you see there, and assuming now we are in my village, and my grandfather is leaving the house, and he's going to the bush to get either some leaves, either some roots of any of those trees that we just showed you there. So my question has always been, as we move on, how did they used to know, maybe it's not the same today, how did they used to know which bush or which tree, and then were they to get the leaves or the twigs, or were they to get the roots? Then they would bring it home, they would either chop it, or wash it, or cut it in small pieces, and the question was for how long they had to boil it and in what quantities. I'm trying to imagine of a dosage. When you go to a modern doctor or modern hospital today, you're given a prescription of some antibiotics and you're told two times two, one times one, after a meal, before meals. I don't know how it used to happen that time. On what dosage, if it was a liquid, how much to take, and once in a day, twice in a day. But it used to work. Maybe not anymore, but now we're still around, hopefully, things will start working. But I've been wondering, you know, I mean, at my age, at my time, things have changed a lot, and I have not seen a lot of people going back to the bush to do the same. With a choice, I would want maybe to go back to those days when you just go to the bush and heal yourself, because I think the traditional medicine has very minimal side effects, if any. What do you think, Steve? Yes, thank you very much, David. Indeed, we are going back in time, and I've gone so far back in time, I'm actually even using a stone tool to make my paste. So I've taken those leaves, I added a little bit of water, now I'm just adding a little bit more cutting to it. Obviously you want it to be not wasted. Jamie, that's a great question. And uh, definitely, because I haven't given too much advice yet this morning, normally what I do, disclaimer on this show, is that there is, I'm not advising anyone to use these plants. Um, the knowledge of these plants is locked away in the minds of certain people. Um, a lot of the knowledge is being lost. And so it's important to know that there are lots of medicinal plants in the wild, but that also the difference between dosage or the difference between medicinal and 
poisonous is very important and dosage is very important. So don't try this at home, folks. It's just nice to delve in to the world of medicinal plants as well. As David said, there's an enormous amount and a lot of it is still harvested from the wild. A lot of it is being passed down from son, from father to son, grandfather to, to grandson, but a lot of it's being lost. So I'm trying to do the best I can to try and keep this information going, to try and, you know, bring it back into cultural thinking, back into sort of the way we do things. So one of the reasons for that. Sammy J, it depends on the remedy. Um, with the leaves, definitely, I mean, here I'm making a very nice paste. Look at the color that's come through there. And it's a very nice paste that I'm going to be able to sort of fashion onto Luke's toe later on. But um, doing it with dry leaves, I don't think it would work very well. It's lost, um, it's lost a lot of its, its, its goodness. But when it comes to bark, bark is definitely something that can be stored. Um, for example, um, the bark I'm using here, I'm using fresh bark. And it's possible that um, older bark works better when it comes to dyeing. But a lot of um, plants you need to... So if I've got the bark like this in large pieces, that's great to dry it like that. But just before using it, then you need to cut it up and break it up into smaller parts. But if I stored this in smaller parts, just like tea bags, uh, tea that is in tea bags have got a shelf life because the particles are so much smaller that they're actually losing their, their, their use over time. So leaving them in larger particles until being used is much, much better. But there's two ways of thinking, fresh versus cut. Um, ideally, you want to dry things out, and some of the things I am drying out, but I am no expert in the matter. I'm just doing my little bit but Luke I have made your paste here is for your wound for later Tony Two Toes I love your name I get most of my information from books um, it's all all on books and a little bit on the internet it's all out there it just has to be searched for but as I say the dosages and exactly how these things are prepared is not always that available but come have a look at the dye process here Ferg it's starting to really get a lovely lovely sort of color I'm trying. <laughs> okay, well, it's struggling to get the color. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use my world-famous enema extractor. Look at that. Look at the coloration there. And that's only been, what, 10 minutes or so? And that's making this beautiful color. Beautiful, beautiful color. So if I let that simmer for another hour, it's going to get really, really nice and dark and purple and all the ingredients out of the bark really, really coming out in their full, full use. But let's go and see exactly what Ralph has been up to. Well, everyone, we've made our way through to Biffle's Hook Waterhole. As you can see, these little terrapins all sunning themselves on the bank. The other ones disappeared off into the water as we made our way in here. Now, the reason we've come up here is because I haven't heard any more alarm calls. But so I'm just starting to loop now in the area that we heard that Nyala barking. And I'm just trying and listening out for any squirrels. Or anything else that's going to give away this predator uh, I think probably most likely uh, Tandi slash Tlalamba that are here in this particular area but it could be any of the leopards it could even be Tingana so we'll just have to find uh, whoever it is and confirm so that's what I'm going to carry on doing now I'm going to go back down on Hyena Road which is um, just on the opposite side of a bit of a drainage line coming from this uh, water hole um, so we were on the eastern side of it now we tracked up along its side of it. that's Hyena Road we're now going to go on the opposite side of it on the western side and just check uh, if we can't see maybe there's some fresh tracks on that side or the leopard itself so that's the idea sorry terrapins you're all gonna go into the water but they can come back out as soon as we've gone Now, Poe, I'm hoping here, I'm actually really hoping that I find uh, Tlalamba and Tandi together. Um, it's not the, the usual haunt of Hukumuri and Shudulu, um, uh, but you never know. Um, but uh, this is where Tandi and Tlalamba have been found in recent times quite regularly. So I'm assuming that it would be one of them. Maybe it's even Tlalamba just on her own. 
and uh, obviously if I do find her on her own uh, we'll just confirm that she's on her own and then I would leave the area. You don't want to be around uh, a young leopard without its mother um, and I obviously wouldn't call it on the radio either because um, we just try to keep activity around a youngster that's um, away from its mother um, to, to a minimum because um, if you are around that situation and, and you, you, you know that the little cat could get scared of you and move uh, in an area maybe that it, it wouldn't normally have gone in. But anyway, it, uh, it waits to be seen because um, first and foremost, we've got to find these leopards. Good luck, Ralph. Good luck. Hope you do come right with a spotted cat this morning. But just to, to rehash on the comment we were making about dosages, when it comes to applying leaves and things like that to a wound, there's nothing really, you can't really overdose that. Um, but when it comes to ingesting things or taking things inside of the body in any way, then that is when um, oxy, obviously toxicity comes into play. And I am not going to be looking at any poisonous, deliberately poisonous plants. Um, the false marula is part of the mango family and the fruits are very, very tasty and very delicious if you can ever find one. Uh, first of all, Herbie eats a lot of them and then all the birds and monkeys absolutely love uh, the fruits. But it is all all-purpose timber. You can make all sorts of stuff with it, but we don't find too many false marulas around. They tend to do very well on termite mounds. But what I was talking about the bark, the bark's quite nice to use and we, we've made a bit of a dye. Obviously this needed to sit or boil a little bit longer so I made it last night so as to to prepare for you because first of all bark holds a lot of the color. Uh, you can make dye out of flowers and leaves as well but they don't have as much um, ability. So bark is very very good. The spongy and the outer bark combined and some people suggest even drying it for up to a year. So that might also have influenced the fact that this dye is not as dark as I'd like it to be but we're experimenting as we go. But time for the big reveal. Now I've got two socks. This sock has got a little bit of dye on it because I had it touching something just now. But you can see it's a relatively relatively white sock is it not? And so I need to make more dye because last night I made some dye and should we have a look at, at my very interesting... <laughs> there is the comparison between sock undyed and sock dyed. So that was just um, with an hour's brewing last night. And then I put this into the dyeing bucket for the whole evening. The bucket wasn't dyeing. It was dye in the bucket. And that's essentially the longer you leave it in, then the better it will be. But maybe if I'd uh, made a stronger dye or the, the, the bark was a little bit older, perhaps it would have worked better. But clear to see. And a very nice dye there. And I now need to make more because my socks look a little bit strange. Yes, well, uh, traditional tattoos, I have no idea, Ashley. Um, but definitely for, for clothing. Herbie, you've said you've used this for, before for dye, haven't you? Yeah, you know, I was talking to Herbie this morning about my segment, and he's like, yes, indeed, we used to use it. But the problem is, or the reality is, is that uh, commercial dyes are so much more freely and easily available that that's what people are doing now. The cultural sort of dynamic in the world these days, everyone's moving away from the landscape and from the environment and going to, to commercially based, commercially built things. So this information is still all there. But it is being lost through the through the sort of generations, and we really need to rehash and bring it back in because there's some wonderful stories, even even just stories, even if we don't eat these things and use them, just to talk about them, really brings back our sense of culture and our sense of survival in the African landscape. Kathy, I think very certain. I mean, I don't know what your thoughts are on on chickens, but chickens to me, go around and pluck and cluck and just do their own thing. But they are smart enough to know when they're ill that they'll eat certain medicinal plants. And I've done permaculture courses, and you plant medicinal plants like uh, wormwood, those sort of things, into gardens where the chickens are. They'll physically go and eat those plants when they're not feeling well. They know how to do that. Um, dogs and cats, when they're not feeling well, they want to maybe regurgitate or go and feed on grass to throw, throw up. Um, and whether other animals have learned that certain things will aid in, in all sorts of things, it's interesting. I mean, for example, the stenbok will feed on the poison apple, uh, but only one a day. 
so as not to over intoxicate its body, even though it's a poisonous plant. So elephants, we know for a fact, go and feed deliberately on trees at certain times. You know, they feed on more trees at this time, bark at this time, roots at that time, fruits and leaves at that time. So I think animals have definitely got the wherewithal. And us as humans, we have it as well. It's passed down. And it was experienced through trial and error and taste and death. And if you died, well, we stopped using that plant. So it's very important, though, indeed, to be aware of what is poisonous and what is not. But I heard the wheels moving of David. He just passed us by just a moment ago. Let's go see where he's going to. Well, that's very true. And I was trying to wonder when, you know, Steve will finish and make sure he brings me some conclusion back home in the camp because if he doesn't do that i'm sure he should know he'll not get any breakfast and so true how the animals will know what to eat because we all imagine like we human beings get sick the animals also get sick but to see a sick animal like down and not moving has been very difficult and we think they'll always know if they have an issue with either digestion, what they will go for, or when to avoid eating a lot. And then that brings me back to our great grandparents, how they used to know, as I was saying before, what plant and what part of the plant to harvest for different uh, diseases or different ailments. So the animals also, I wish anybody could understand their language, they would, I'm sure, tell us a lot. You've seen elephants. Oops, sorry. Back up a little bit. Oh, yeah, this one little terrapin there. Oh, didn't see it. Are you able to get there? See a little terrapin on the road there. Craig spot, very good. Good spotting, Craig. And I do not know why she should be there. And there's a water hole not far from here, but I'm sure the longer she stays out there, could be a bit tricky because terrapins are known to be very water dependent, and she be come, could be have been coming from somewhere that was pretty close. I would have felt so guilty to go that, and she blends in very well there. And luckily, Craig is sitting on the side, on the left side of the car, give him a good angle to spot it, and that's a much terrapin. And what we normally try to do is not to interfere with them or try and take it close to water because definitely it's coming from somewhere too young to be on her own there. But so long as she'll be walking through the grass or thickets and getting some good cover or some good shade, she'll be fine and then most likely she'll end up on a waterhole. And the shell or the body they carry is very good cover for them. And so long as the legs and the head don't get so exposed to the sun, it should be fine for them. We'll always try to leave all oh, these animals where you find them. I have always believed in the principle, leave it where you found it. Not even touching it or trying to lift it and putting it, you know, in a safe area. My guess is there's nobody who will be driving behind me. I could be the only person around this road. So she should be fine. Kathy, good question. Do I think she's stuck by that branch? What I can see, Kathy, from here, that branch to me is very light. And I do not think that should be a concern for it. And if so, yes, I would be more than happy to uh, not lift the branch for it, but seeing it go through. Maybe because of the movement of the car, she most likely have picked or she picked our movement and she stopped. And because they are very good, she must have looked where she was going through. And definitely she made a judgment that she would go through. It's a lot easier going under that branch than going over the branch. So I'm sure, Kathy, she should be fine and she'll make her way to some safe area or a watering hole later in the day. All right, Ruff, tell us something, Ruff. Yes, well, I don't have too much to say, especially around something, but um, 
I have still been searching for this this leopard that um, we seem to be a little bit unlucky because not exactly able to find the nice fresh tracks but look up in front there we've got an elephant now I'm just a bit disappointed that we haven't been able to find this leopard because obviously when you hear Nyala barking that is a guarantee that it's nearby but anyway it's not every day that we're going to be able to find them Now, Nisa, um, it was just the other day. I haven't spotted the cub while she's been, um, about, while mom's been away. But uh, David uh, was at Biffles Hook Waterhole and he had exactly that. And she was quite nervous, but she, it looked like she came down for a little drink and then she, um, and then she went off and scuttled off into the bushes. So um, she would be rather nervous without mommy there. Let's just stop here. We've got a little a couple of elephants here. So it looks like they're enjoying a little bit of feeding. That's nice. Obviously a female here with her calf. I wonder if there's any others around. And we'll just have to see. I'm not 100% sure it is a female, the, the mommy of this one here. Just have to wait and see. And I don't know, it might be um, that uh, female with the tip of her trunk missing. Let's just see. Is it? Ashley, absolutely. You say the best type of traffic jam. Uh, yeah, elephants stopping you on the road is always amazing. And it seems that it's not the female with a little bit of a trunk missing. This one has got its full trunk. It's just resting it there a little bit on that small red bush willow shoot. Happily feeding, yeah. And this female... Oh, quite possibly the mother of that little youngster there. It's also trying to feed, looks like on a on a apple leaf. Now, Ravinda, um, I've had many, many uh, funny uh, incidences with um, baby Ellie's, but the one that um, that I could think of right now was one with a tiny little baby that was being very boisterous next to, uh, it seemed like the matriarch was its mom, and there was some little... Uh, uh, wagtails, cape wagtails that were just moving around the elephants, you know, because the elephants bump up the insects for them, so they often move around the elephants. And this little youngster was uh, charging at this um, little wagtail, but every time he had charged at it, it would just fly and go on the other side of the mother. And so then it would charge at it again, and this little wagtail was very fleetingly just zipping around and going and then carrying on with its waggy tail on the other side and this the, the baby elephant was really running from one side to the other with its ears out and trumpeting after this little wagtail so it was quite amusing i think the wagtail was probably like what on earth are you on about little elephant um, as he carried on well he probably quite enjoyed it because as the little baby elephant was running around he was probably bumping up a whole lot more insects so but it was very comical to watch how that um, tiny little baby thought he was being very important by chasing a wagtail around I'm just hearing some more branches breaking but I can't see uh, there's an elephant there I thought that all disappeared there's one there that we could maybe watch a little bit longer. Let's see. He was breaking some branches just behind that bush there. So, yeah, you can imagine how comical it would be with a massive elephant chasing a tiny little wagtail. Although it wasn't a massive, you know, elephant in terms of its age, but still in comparison to the little wagtail. And no, this is not the best for us. It's one little straggler there that I think is going to catch up with the rest of the herd. Let's see if there's not some more a little bit further down the road 
that we could see a bit more clearly. There was a little baby there, they've moved off in there. It's like a small herd, I think, unless we might uh, find some more of them. But, well, that's what we're going to continue on and see if we can do. Well, we haven't seen a kill for a long time, but we're seeing one here. And I guess this is what used to be a scrub here. And as I was coming closely, I just saw two big raptors fly away as we were approaching and thought they could have been eating something on the ground. And on a closer look, I found this to be a scrub here. I'm not sure it's the two birds or the two raptors that killed it, or it was killed by, you know, some other predator. It's about nine o'clock in the morning, and normally scrub hares are very nocturnal. They should have been away somewhere in bed, in the warrant. But I'm trying to think what might have killed it because at the same area we saw two huge raptors. Yes, let's see. Let's look at those two raptors, and I saw the two huge birds there. That one is very silhouetted, but it looks like to be like either a Tony eagle. It could be like a Tony eagle, and then. On its left, way on the left, there's another bird of prey there, and it looked to me from a distance like right there. Let's look at another raptor, and we're thinking it's definitely a juvenile bachelor. And the two of them are the ones that were feeding on this kill here. So, the Tony Eagle, I guess it's Tony Eagle, and that is a batch lure. And I think the two of them could have been feeding on this. As we got here, they flew off, and looking carefully on the ground, we just saw this, used to, what used to be a scrub here. Sorry about my head there, but I'm just trying to guess. It's either them who killed it, and either they saw it from the air and went for it, but the possibility of them having killed it, I doubt. These are two different bird species. But you never know. And if they may need to go back to their kill, we'll just have to move and let them come enjoy their meal. But that's exciting to see a kill that we have not seen a kill for a long time. And especially of a small little guy, like a scrub hare. All right. That's flying away, Craig. Sorry, I didn't mean to move you around. I don't know that's flying away of the, the Tony Eagle. It's just flying in the air and maybe trying to tell us are we going to come? Are you going to leave so that you can come to a kill? That's the big raptor that I guessed to be the Tony Eagle. And using the heat thermos. Flap, then glind, flap, then glind. And I'm sure sooner or later she'll be coming. She'll be coming back to their kill and going to tell them bon appetit. And let's find out how their Monday medication day is going. Thank you. We have packed up the medicinal information and we have moved off. Thank you for joining me and for being patient during those segments. Um, we've got a little tree here, a dead one indeed. We were talking yesterday, someone was asking me about how hard um, certain trees will stay around and we spoke about the, the false marula yesterday and how quickly they will just sort of degrade back into the soil because it's not the very hard wood. But this is very very hard i mean it's been lying on the ground for probably well quite a long time uh, it looks to me to be part of a leadwood leadwood stump and it's actually even succumbed to fire at certain points you can see on the side here fire is burnt and yet the tree is well the stump is still there and we can actually go a little bit further down without me getting in the shadow and have a look how long this tree has actually been here by the fact that the roots are in the air the plant is completely out of the ground this is the root area so how it fell over is very hard to say but you can see that the roots are completely exposed they've been broken down completely and there's no hole left in the ground which means we're looking at many years that this tree has been lying on its side like that many years <laughs> When I say many, I'm probably saying more than five, but probably could even be ten. These trees, when they die, can stand dead for up to a hundred years without decomposing and then falling down on the ground. Um, so 
In comparison to the false marula, this will last a lot longer on the ground and the amount of habitat it produces, the amount of sort of area for creatures to hide themselves in is enormous. When you look at an insect life cycle, that's about sometimes one day, two days, three days a week. Ashley, thank you very much. You can't wait till next Monday. Well, I will see what we'll bring up next week. Um, there's lots and lots of plants to be added to the list, um, including guaris like I have behind me including leadwoods like this one on the ground so we'll see wait and see for next week to see exactly which medicinal plant I choose all right everyone we have um, we've come down uh, into the Mlawati uh, because this is the area where we also found Tingana um, on Saturday so just having a check in here and this also leads us back to where you know a similar area to where we heard um, those alarm calls from the Nyala um, but nothing since then so I'm just carrying on the typical search pattern and just made it a little bit bigger and here we go down through a loop uh, through a dip and Senzo says this is Senzo's dip here in the Milwati because this road doesn't have a name so he's taken it upon himself to name it after himself, as you do, I suppose. But, yeah, and Luke saying, like Senzo and his socks in the wash, he just takes anything. <laughs> I think Senzo has been uh, wearing other people's socks, not only his own fancy ones. You want to show us what socks you've got on today, Senzo? There we go. There's uh, Senzo's colourful socks for the morning. Um, thanks, Senzo. Right. So, as per usual, search continues. Well, I don't know what socks Senzo's wearing today. Sometimes he loves the ones that got bacon and eggs on them. And if he is wearing the ones with bacon, well, we may be having some bacon here. And Senzo should be here and know what exactly got some warthogs, bacon and sausages, sometimes they'll call them. There's a huge family of them. I've never seen a family that has many piglets. I had counted about five piglets, three of the same age and two of different ages. And you see how the earls go down on the kneel, on the knees and kneeling down to reach the ground food and to have a leverage on their neck to be able to scalp all the food they can get in terms of plants or rhizomes or roots of the grass. I don't know where Tingana is in Tandi. They should know there should be some nice pork chops around. Dekarora, you say this is a great finding, yes, and they are elusive, you know, watogs, and they look small, but they are always entertaining. When you remember the movie Lion King, if you ever saw, you know, if you remember Pumba, they are small, but they are always quite entertaining. And to see, I think, a of them together here, I've seen eight. Uh, I don't remember the last time I saw eight watogs together with five piglets and three fully grown ones. It's interesting to see all of them together. And they'll keep digging for food. And they love open areas. Very unusual to see them going in very heavy thickets, of course, because of their safety and security. All right, people, uh, we'll be moving on. And hopefully, Tingana will know, or oh, Tandi, just got some nice pork chops here. But more so, Hukumuru, which we think has specialized in bringing down the watchhogs. Okay. Let's move on and see if we could be lucky to see some birds. Jason, how are you? Oh, it's good to hear your name. Have I ever seen wild dogs bring, I mean, uh, wild dogs bring down a wild dog? Not really, but wild dogs could be very crude sometimes, and I'm sure they do it and they might have done it personally. I have not witnessed that take down, but definitely I'm sure they will do that and they have done that many times of course depending on the size of the pack of the wild dogs but most important wild dogs Jason are very fast very fast I think 
they might even do 35 kilometers you know speed per hour and maybe a lot faster than wild dogs wild dogs will not want to catch prey that are pretty fast they want slow moving you know animals they, they can keep chasing and trying to out tear them and once they get tired that's the time they'll attack but anything that is swift like Watog, as much as they look short and small they're very fast and jason i highly doubt you know they would go for them but if they corner them for example because that should happen as well dogs travel in big parks anything six ten sometimes up to fifty if they corner them i mean the warthog will not have much of a choice eh? and sometimes you have noticed the trauma alone of the prey just seeing the predators or the animals that want to bring them down the trauma alone just makes them freeze and they don't move you know you just like you walking and you end up meeting such a huge polar bear the first thing before you flee you're like what do i do next you know very good we haven't seen wild dogs of late jason but you always have them around And you're asking, do warthogs mate for life? I doubt. I do not know, but I would say I doubt. And they are not monogamous, like most, you know, four-legged animals that we have always seen around here, the quadruples. I don't think they mate for life. They'll have these loose relationships, and maybe once in a while they go separate ways. But it could be a possibility that they also mate for life. But I would say for a fact, I do not know that for sure. Oops, sorry, just bumped to a kudu there. Actually, you're asking the possibility of a relationship of the normal warthogs, as see, we see a huge kudu there with warthogs. That's a good question. I don't know how they would relate, but I found myself the warthogs being a bit sneaky and not easy to tame. I highly doubt because uh, they would not be as easy to tame as we would do with the pigs. I don't think they would make a very good gel, actually. I highly doubt. Good evening, Mr. Kudu. How are you? It's a very good profile, eh? So, yeah, I doubt the white hogs could make a very good blend if we would put them to the normal pigs that we have in our homes. The pigs being so loud and so noisy, I don't think the white hogs would love that. And just like the kudu going away the warthogs would want also to go away and get away from the noisy pigs that we always have at our homes and also looking at warthogs i think they are much cleaner than the pigs pigs you need to keep cleaning them every time they identify themselves and i think the warthogs are much cleaner what huge rock of horns that that kudu got there and i would wish i'd get one point when he dies, one of the horns to make a flute as a musical instrument. He is fading away there. Not sure he is going towards the bushwalk team. Thanks, David. Well, we found a false marula, so we can give you an example of what it looks like. And very characteristic, the bark. The bark looks like strips of bacon on attached on the side of the tree. So you went to grilled up some bacon and you stuck it on the side yeah just imagine the color being a little bit pinker that's kind of what you're looking at it makes it quite easy to identify and um, marulas are very similar but marulas the end of the sticks of the stems are very fat like my pinky very very fat whereas these are sticks they're not very um what's the word not very fat <laughs> nice and skinny remember yesterday we looked at a um we looked at a false marula and you can see how this is not breaking which means it's still alive and still fresh. Uh, what was the name there? Sorry, Luke. Love, love Hope Place, where we find the best medicinal plants. It's all over the place, but generally the harder a plant has to work, um, you can get very, very high quality plants. So in desert areas, areas that are very harsh, you can find all sorts of things that grow there, especially bulbs and tubers under the ground. That can be extremely poisonous, but in their right levels as well, they can be used medicinally. But it all depends where they live. Generally, medicinal value in a plant is there to prevent it from being eaten in a way. So that is what we're trying to harness out of it. So when you, the harsher the environment and the more protection the plant's trying to put into itself to prevent being eaten, the higher that sort of medicinal sort of or phenolic 
sort of level will be. The less it works, the lower. So if you take a medicinal plant and you grow it in a nursery with fertilizer and water, you're not going to get the same quality versus wild harvested plants. That was one of the things I looked at in my thesis was organically growing medicinal plants to see if we can sort of curb the, the unnatural or the unsustainable harvesting in the wild because by giving organic material, natural organic material, you're giving the plant what it needs. Uh, giving it fertilizer is not the idea. It makes it grow, but it's not working hard. It's being nursed, being nannied and growing very easily without any difficulty. Definitely. Same as Jane, leeches, most definitely. Maggots, I'm not 100% sure, but leeches, definitely, they're blood purifiers. They'll suck things out of the blood. So I don't know at what extent le uh, maggots are used, but they do have a sort of flesh-eating, decaying-eating sort of ability, but I don't know of anyone who uses them. But leeches are still quite well used, especially in sort of the, um, the, the plastic surgery industry as well, to, to take all the blood out. Because obviously when you do a whole lot of cutting, uh, you get a whole lot of blood, and leeches will suck out all of that sort of coagulated blood. So Herbie found us something. <laughs> Fergus is called gangrene. So here is the false marula. And Herbie showed us something here, and these are the, 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 the fungus that's growing on the roots. It's at the base of this tree now. It's not actually on the roots, but it's on the base of the tree. Can you see it's a little brown, little hair-like fungus? That's exactly what they use for the sedative, for, for inhaling, for a snuff, for burning, and that is what aids in the forgetfulness. Herbie said that as naughty boys in his culture, they used to wrap this around themselves because they'd go out hunting birds and they would cover the, themselves in this fungus and it would make the birds forget that they were there. Whether it worked or not, probably did from a placebo point of view, but very nice little story indeed. And that is the fungus there. So we're nearly home. Ferg, do you want to take a snuff before? He's, he's shaking his head. He's not wanting. So that you could inhale, into, make into a powder and inhale, and it would just calm you right down. Maybe a little bit too calm. We're going to leave it. Um, I don't know the dosage, as I said earlier, it's important that you're careful with these sort of things. But uh, great that we found it right towards the end of drive. And we've been tracking all sorts of animals, lots of tracks on the road. But it seems like Ralph has found the animals that we've seen there, only tracks moving this way. Yes, the donkey in pyjamas. Nice to see the zebra around. And I think there's a little calf here that we have been seeing, but it's hiding itself in the bushes there, a little bit behind the thickets over there. So we're just seeing these little stripes in between all the leaves and the grass. There it's moving forward. Maybe it will give us a chance to see it nicely. Lots of stripes there, hey. And you can actually see how, uh, even though with the black and white, uh, you would expect that to stand out because it's very contrasting colors, but it actually breaks up the outline of the body as well and makes them blend uh, into the bush quite uh, astonishingly. And also assists, obviously, when they are trying to evade predators with all those stripes moving past each other. Difficult for the predator to isolate one individual. But look at that there. I mean, that's a zoom out. And then obviously when we zoom in, it does become more uh, or easier to see them. But it just indicates that um, black and white, if used correctly, even contrasting to all the colors in the bush mostly, still can um, make you rather camouflage. And look at that. As they're happily grazing through the bush. Now, fan favorites, it seems, for the, the zebra are for everybody. It's always nice to see them. They are so photogenic and, and videogenic, I think if that's a word. There's that little one. Nice and fluffy. Happily swishing the tail, keeping the flies at bay, and then uh, just feeding along nicely. So typical grazers, hey, you won't really, you know, I always have to catch myself because um, I've said it many times, like with the black rhino being a browser and saying that uh, you wouldn't find them grazing. I've found them doing that in the Maasai Mara. But uh, I have to say that I've never seen a zebra browsing. They are traditional grazers and bulk grazers at that. 
Um, and I know that, like, in the Namib Desert, in the um, Namib Nauklift Park in Namibia, um, there they've got the Hartman's Mountain zebra, and it was an endangered species, um, but uh, a lot of the sort of private landowners there are actually trying to get them to shift that uh, that classification along because they would actually like to um, harvest some of them, and it's not because they just want to use the zebra. Um, they are bulk grazers, and if you have increased in numbers on your uh, property, they can very quickly overgraze the area and a lot of these private landowners are actually experiencing this with the Hartman's mountain zebra and I know from chatting to them personally um, going and staying on different um, small lodges in the in the Sussus Flay area and they've all been protecting these Hartman's mountain zebra but now they're finding it difficult um, with the uh, increase in, in the population and uh, a lot of overgrazing so they're actually asking government to try and uh, assist them in, in being able to um, utilize them in different ways or whatever that might be or, or um, you know transport them somewhere else now, NYC, um, the trouble, you know, thanks for your comments saying that they look well fed. Uh, the, the, it's, it's quite difficult, however, with zebra to tell when they're not well fed. The only way really is to see on their rump if, they, if their bones are showing in any way whatsoever because um, they are hind gut fermenters, so they always have fat bellies um, because of the gas that's produced from the fungus that uh, assists in that uh, fermentation process of the grass. So always like horses, donkeys, um, uh, generally, um, you know, fat regardless of their, their, um, their status in terms of condition. So not always that easy to tell if they are in bad condition or not um, with regards to what they've been eating as well because that stomach always remains bloated and full of gas. But uh, they do look in, in uh, good condition, I must say. Uh, love, hope, faith, that little youngster, I would have to say, is probably a few months old at least. I would, you know, it's um, getting a little bit older. It's not, not a tiny little newborn, um, but I would say, uh, you know, between about four and six months. I would probably press closer to six months, however. Um, I'm just taking a guess. I only saw it briefly. It's moved off now. Uh, but I would have to say that it's almost at the point where it wants to start losing that really baby or foal type um, hair, the real fluffy nature to it, and it's starting to look uh, a little bit more like an adult or sub-adult. So they seem to be moving a little bit further off into the bush, and as they're doing that, I think it's time for us also to move on. Yes, wonderful to see zebras. We haven't seen them for a couple of days. And I'm just enjoying myself doing the Muluwati cruise slowly, slowly, and finding out if we could see any ellies along this uh, dry river bend. We have seen elephants enjoying a bit of uh, trees because at least they would know this could be some water underground. And the trees along this Muluwati area have always remained green and not once we have come along this area and found Ellie's trying to pull a few leaves from whether they're lidu trees or the bush willows that could be growing around this area and I was wondering if the cats might have decided to come and take some cover here Martini, great question. Can the elephants differentiate between a vehicle and a person? And I would say yes, 100%. Ellis or elephants are very intelligent. And uh, Craig, let me know. We've got a low line. All right, sorry for that, everybody. You know how those gremlins sometimes work. Uh, you, they attack when you least expect them, and, um, well, it can always happen um, 
as I say, when you least expect it. So we'll just carry on here. I'm just moving through an area where we have also spotted some of the, the leopards. This is now moving up back towards quarantine. So just looking for any sign, you know, this morning, sometimes that's, that's what can be a little bit frustrating when there's lots of tracks, etc. And then um, you come up cold without, uh, without a result, but that's wildlife. So. Josh, um, thanks for your question. I'd have to say... Um, my two favorite leopards and uh, you know that's just because I like that uh, youthful exuberance and not taking anything away from the older experienced uh, leopards but I have to say Hukumuri and Shidulu are my two favorite um, I can't quite choose between them but um, I, I do think Hukumuri might edge it but I do so the best male well my favorite I would say Hukumuri and female being Shidulu However, um, that's not to say that uh, Tingana, Tandi, Tlalamba are not absolutely fascinating and wonderful to watch. I uh, just, um, if you had to press me, which you have, uh, I would say, Hukumuri. There we go. I just love that. Uh, you're almost like Mike Tyson. So he's just uh, looking for a fight and ready for anything that. Uh, gets thrown at him. And it'll be interesting to see how things play out as we go forward with these leopards. Um, and all we can do is put ourselves out there and just watch. So that's going to be great. So we're slowly heading towards the end of our morning or sunrise safari once again. And uh, I wonder if we'd be able to see that little babbler there. But, uh, well, it's just a little babbler there. I don't know. They're always difficult to spot because they always move off. Now, thanks to the team once again, the guiding team, uh, David and Steve, and all the FC crew, the cam ops, and thanks to all of you, the viewers. Um, and join us again this afternoon for another uh, Safari Live Safari. Bye for now, everyone. I'm signing out.